We ready? Thank you. Morning, everyone. Today is Tuesday, September 27th. I'm going to call the Economic Development, Technology, and Tourism Committee to order. Please call the roll. Councilwoman Johnson? Present. Councilwoman Dockery? Here. Councilman Warren? Present. Councilman Jones? Here. Chair Ford? Present. Okay, we have one item. It's the update of minority and women-owned business enterprise in MWBE, all council districts requested by the administration. Who do we have from the administration? Okay. I'm Val Mitchell. I'm the director of Office of Business Diversity and Compliance. Okay. We're going to turn everything over to you. Thank you. you can go you right ahead. Presentation. Have I can't hardly hear you. See if you can. Okay. I'm sorry. How about now, Council? Okay. Good. It's better. You're good. Thank you all for the opportunity to uh, present this. I think it's uh, great news, uh, at, e at least from my perspective, for the seven months I've been a part of the, uh, the city. Uh, it's been a pleasure to work uh, with a group of people that are very knowledgeable and compassionate about uh, what they're doing. As we go through this presentation, it's not a canned presentation, so you guys feel free to ask and ladies, feel free to ask any questions as we go through. We'd be happy to explain as, uh, as, as we go, as we finish. Uh, if you take a look at the first slide, do we have those up yet? There it is. Um, this will be an update. Uh, could you go to the next slide, please? Uh, prior to uh, COVID, uh, things were, uh, we just had a lot of activity. Uh, as you know, as, as everybody did, things slowed down. But right after that, we have no, announced that we were open for business. And as you can see here, the total amount of clients, the total amount of workshops, uh, the workshop attendance, and the uh, uh, streaming videos that we have done. Uh, the Entrepreneurial Business Center over on Danny Thomas has been open for business, and we've had just a plethora of people to come through and to uh, take advantage of the opportunities that we've had there. If you go to the next slide, please, sir. Um, our flagship piece is We Mean a Business Success Summit. Uh, we did it at the Renaissance uh, Business Center, I mean, the Renaissance Convention Center. We had over 400 uh, people to attend, uh, business owners. We also participated in the uh, uh, several other workshops, which were the uh, Black Restaurant Week, the OBDC Girls Mean Business, along with the Memphis Business Journal, uh, the One Million uh, Black Business Initiative. Uh, I am certified, so now what's next? Uh, uh, a partnership with MAMCA and uh, the OSHA training that they do uh, with residential contractors. And also right here, I'd like to say that we're participating with Tennessee Small Business Association as well as the, uh, uh, the BBA. One of the primary things I thought was really uh, nice and really well attended was the Women's Entrepreneur Her Mixer, where we had over 150 women business owners to show up uh, with just great ideas and participated uh, way beyond what I thought it would have been. I mean, it was a glowing success. Uh, this last, on the right-hand corner, it's in Spanish. Uh, we've got a Hispanic uh, population that we, in a Spanish-speaking uh, folks, we've got two people on our staff who are bilingual, and we're just making inroads in that community uh, tremendously. And I think we're going to see a lot that has happened already, but more that's going to come. Any questions so far? Okay. Uh, I'm going to ha ask Sarah to come up. We're getting to the the uh, the numbers piece of this on the next slide, and she'll talk about that. Yeah, so before we jump into the numbers, I just wanted to review um, where the numbers come from and how we calculate them. So up in the left-hand um, corner, you can see that from a whole, the formula is simply the total MWBE spend over the total city spend. We break that out a little bit further, and we include direct MWBE spend, so payments directly made from the city to an MWBE firm plus subcontractor spend. So the OBDC contract compliance um, for any contract that has an EBO goal on it, they monitor that and monitor the payments from the prime to the sub um, in their system, and we capture that spend as well. Um, down at the bottom, we have the city total spend, less exclusions, and we're going to talk about the exclusions in greater detail in a couple slides. But um, at a whole, those are things where there's either no MWBE in that market 
or it's the type of spend where MWE spend is not possible. So that's things like government agencies, employee reimbursement, um, payments to nonprofits, things like that. Um, over on the right, those are our data sources. So my office pulls um, a list of all the city checks that were written last year from the city's financial system, Oracle, and then we match that those payments to OBDC system, B2G, that contains um, that subcontractor spend I mentioned, and then the list of certified um, MWBE vendors. And then lastly, we have those exclusions. Um, since my office partnered with OBDC back in 2019, we've maintained a list of exclusions in um, partnership with OBDC and then the divisions as well. With that, I'm going to pa pass it back to Director Mitchell to go over our numbers. Uh, she went over that fairly quickly. Are there any questions about that? It, it took me a minute to kind of get this. I, I mean, because I guess uh, coming into the government piece and a lot of the acronyms. Um, so if you go to the very next slide, this one I think is probably the most pertinent piece. The total uh, MBE spend, we kind of compared to FY21 to FY22. In FY21, it was uh, 87 million. Uh, in FY22, we're 103 million. So we're up about $16 million in terms of growth from year to year. Uh, if you also take a look at the certified uh, percentages, uh, we're at 21% versus uh, 22 in, in FY21, it was at 23.4. And that's because of an increase of $126 million of eligible spend. So we added another $126 million, even though the number's bigger, the percentage is a little bit lower, but the number has increased. And I think the incremental increase from year to year is a lot simpler for me to understand. I don't, I don't know if it is for you guys, but it, it just made a lot of sense to me. We do have a group of people, what we call, well, not, we call they are uh, non-certified uh, businesses. In other words, these are businesses that are doing business with the city, but they've not been certified. We give them advantages to being certified, but it's not mandatory. In other words, you can do business as a minority vendor or woman-owned business without being part of our certification process. But we don't count that because we've not done the due diligence to find out are they who they say they are, have we done all the things that we need for certification. If you add that back into it, now we're at 27%. There was an extra $26 million that was done in that space uh, from over the, the last year. So that would take our total spend from 103 up to about $130 million if we included those folks that were non-certified. And by the way, we are diligently trying to get them uh, certified as, as quickly as possible. And for some reasons, they decide they just don't want to be. And as a result of that, we cannot force them to, but they are good business people. And the whole idea behind the program is certainly to increase the amount of spend. And, and so that's heading in the right direction. It doesn't help my numbers, but my numbers look pretty good already at any rate. OK, if you go to the next slide, please. Um, and, and this is one by division. And you know we had some long discussions about the percentages. If you take a look at the information technology, their overall budget is 26 million, but the eligible spend is 19 million. And so they're at 41.9%. But if you go down to public works, their budget is 257 million, and they spent 27 million. So they spent more money with the minority vendor and women owned businesses than the entire budget of IT services, but their percentage is only 11.72. So the percentages are good, a uh, one indicator, but it, it's not the only indicator, okay? Any questions so far? Uh, the next slide. This slide shows uh, the breakdown in terms of Asian, Black, uh, uh, white, Hispanic, Latino, Native American, and it shows a grand total. It goes male, female, the totals, the percentages, and so forth. Obviously, uh, because of the large African American population, we're at 67 million, which is 65% of the overall spend number, which all in includes down to the $103 uh, million that we did in FY22. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, the increase pretty much has come from uh, Liberty Park 
Uh, we had another six million uh, with uh, precise contracting, Mud Island, uh, Cobblestone Works. And then if you drop down to the uh, sewer assistance rehab pro pro project, that number is a second tier type of, of, of project where we actually spend money with other vendors who turn around and spend it with minority contractors, but we don't count that in our, what I consider to be our, our, our le uh, not legitimate, because all of it's legitimate, but uh, in our actual t numbers. If we did, we would be at 24% instead of 21%. So we're just showing you a bigger picture of, of where the tax dollars are actually going. Uh, next slide, please. Um, I've been asked, you know, where are we actually spending money? There were 26 certified vendors that did over a million dollars worth of business with the city of Memphis in FY22. So it's not that we're just doing business with just a few people, we're increasing our pool. Now, we, uh, two people, Pfeiffer and Associates, and also Nixon General Contractors, we kind of highlighted those because those two contractors started out as subcontractor, and now they're doing prime contractor work. So the intent of the project is to grow the businesses, if you will, and so we're, we're doing well in that area as well. And so uh, this just kind of shows the vendors that we did and how much money we did with those. So we are not just looking at one or two contractors, but a plethora, and we're looking to add additional contractors as we go. I'd like to note something right here, if it's okay with you guys, where we have ineligible spend. Uh, the mayor and uh, Director Moody and the senior leadership team have asked me to look at other areas, other vendors outside to try to get other businesses included in this. So we, we've looked at things like the uh, automobile, and I think that's been a big thing that's come up all the time. Well, I found out that you need a fleet service, not a, necessarily a dealership. So we're looking at other vendors to come in with fleet service. And financial services, there's some areas that we could look at within the city for other opportunities for other vendors to come in. So as we uh, increase our pool of vendors, we're looking in the areas where we don't have any and trying to make that pool bigger as well and offer opportunities for folks that are here. Councilman Ford, you look like you had a question. Okay, all right, uh, the next slide. These are uh, where we look at the exclusions, and like I say, as we uh, make the exclusions smaller, the eligible spend becomes bigger, and so as a result of that, hopefully the pie becomes bigger and we could do additional business with uh, businesses that uh, we don't have in our, our pipeline at this present time. Uh, but the majority of the exclusions obviously are going to be government agencies, as Sarah said, uh, banks, nonprofits. Uh, we had quite a bit of money that was uh, given back in property tax uh, abatements and things of that nature, refunds and so forth. Uh, next slide. Uh, this is where we're going. Uh, we've got uh, opportunities coming up. Uh, Let's talk business workshop, uh, pre-certification workshops. Uh, competitors, British Accelerator Program. That's where we're teaching people to go from uh, subcontractor to prime contractor. We're going through all the steps with them to help them understand better what it takes to be a prime contractor. Uh, we're partnering with uh, Tennessee Small Business, Black Business Association, MAMCA, Operation Hope. Uh, we've got another certification process. I'm certified, so what's next? Uh, people come and get certified and they said, well, we didn't get a phone call, we didn't get any business, so we're trying to encourage them to not only wait for us, but to look for opportunities. And, and our division is helping them uh, within the city as well. Um, the uh, future partnerships that we've got, uh, we got Lemoyne Owen College that we've started uh, uh, working with them, but in addition to Lemoyne, uh, the University of Memphis, FedEx, Christian Brothers University, uh, and then right here, I'd like to note that we didn't put this as a part of the slide, but the American Contractors, American, Contract uh, these acronyms are getting me, American Contract Compliance Association is gonna be hosted in Memphis. We are hosting that event. We went to it in Charlotte uh, a couple of months ago, and Memphis will host that event here next year. That is a huge, uh, I think, uh, a deal that's gonna go on. And so uh, that's a part of what we've got. And that's a training institute where it teaches people to become uh, uh, in the certification process and how we, we work that. Uh, we are open for questions. Sarah, come on back in. <laughs> uh, 
Um, my question is going and looking at the the total spend versus the total eligible spend. And, you know, I know a lot of it is, is government agencies, uh, banks, nonprofit, but the one that just jumps out at me, and, you know, I know this is not your department, so you just have to go back to the actual division heads. Um, retirement investors, a, a spend of $9 million. And so as I look at the total eligible spend of 288, I, I, being that's my industry, I find it hard that the ineligible spend is so huge for this one. And it just has me wondering what other divisions, because if you exclude so much, you look at 86% minority spend, that's an absolutely fantastic number. But knowing that there are other firms out there, $9 million, there's not just $300,000 worth of eligible spend Absolutely. in this. So it just has me, this is the one, and I just, what can we do to sort of, um, and I know you, what you've done in the conversation that you and I have had, you've brought back in what some of that eligible spend is to make these numbers look more accurate. But just looking at some of the other ones here, uh, especially when there's such a big decrease, what would be helpful is when we look at these numbers to say that this total eligible spend in this case, well, uh, in this case is only such a, you know, this is two, three, four percent mm -hmm. of this total number. So we're excluding 95 percent of the spend. So it would be helpful to look at those that have a huge number of uh, ineligible spend to see what's missing from those numbers. How can we do, how can we do that? In well, we, we've been talking about this, and, and, and the mayor has asked me to do this, asked my okay. division to go and look in these specific areas. And because there's a, I've got a, a pretty good handle on the amount of businesses that are out here, there's certainly a number of them that I don't know of and don't know about. So I'd like to sit down with you or okay. any of the other council members and talk about how we can we can do this. Now we've increased it from where we were to 126 million from one side of the pot over to the other side. But certainly there are areas like this that I'm not familiar with, right. or I don't know people. But he's asked me to go and take a look at these areas and come back with suggestions to the senior leadership <coughs> team of how we can do exactly what you just talked about. So okay. if there's areas that you know about or businesses that you know about, we can take a look at this and try to impact that uh, uh, a, a whole lot more. Well, yeah, and, and it's just going to be one that I'm familiar with, but still looking at, and I'm looking at, um, uh, housing and community development, you know, we are talking about a $40 million difference between ineligible spend, just some of those that, that jump out and then just doing a, a deeper dive on okay. some of those, but we can have that conversation offline, but that I got you. Okay. Happened. Well, okay. we'll make a note and if next week or week after next, that's okay. I'd like to come sit down with you and we'll talk about it. And I can tell you about something I've already started looking at. Okay. Because I've, I've st we've started down this road. We just don't have concrete. And then, of course, we got to make the suggestions back to the senior leadership team and then get the people in the process. Right. Okay. Thank, Thank you. you. That's a great question. Thank you, Mr. Thanks. Chair. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Chair, so much. Thank you, Mr. Mitchell and your team for the work that you've done. Um, I, too, am available for any uh, research information that you might need or assistance that I can provide. But I'm just so happy that you've come aboard, done as much work as you have done, and the impact that you're having in the community. We're going to just have to keep on pushing, keep on pushing to get it done. So, you know, I wish you the best. And uh, I always remember, help us here. Just let us know what you need. Thank you. I, I appreciate it. You know, uh, I got to tell you that uh, I walked into an organization that had just a great staff of people who were willing to work, and, and they've just been uh, uh, a joy to work with. And to, uh, you know, even though we're at 103, we're up 16 million, I think it's something to celebrate, but it's not something to stop, and we're not at the top of the mountain, but uh, I'm pretty happy about where we are, but we certainly can go further, and I appreciate your help and, and your offer in that area. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. Can you hear me, Mr. Mitchell? 
No, ma'am. I'm sorry. Can you hear me now? I can't. A little bit better. I have a question. Good morning to you first. Good morning. Um, I'm very familiar with the process. Very familiar. Can you hear me now, Mr. Mitchell? The voice is so soft here. I promise. <laughs> Can you hear me now? I can. Okay, I'm sorry. Good morning. I have one question. When it comes to the outreach community engagement piece, um, as it relates to making sure, I think the only thing that I am curious about outside of the budget, and Chairman already asked a question that I wanted to ask, so that was great for me, is how do we make sure everyone has knowledge of what's going on because a lot of people don't get this. It's almost like a, um, you have to have access to certain people to know certain things. Th that would be my only question, sir. Well, we, we, we've heard that over and over, and that's a great question. Um, obviously, we're on Facebook, Twitter, all the social media pieces. Uh, we're talking to a number of folks. Uh, in B2G, is we've got over 600 uh, certified businesses that we send email to on a pretty regular basis. And to be honest with you, I was shocked when we offer an event over at the ENC. How many people show up? Uh, when we did the We Mean Business Symposium, I mean, we, it, it just was overwhelming to me how many people, but there's still a need to reach more, more people. And so we're going to uh, Lamorne Owen College to try to talk to people. We're going to uh, Christian Brothers University. We're going to the University of Memphis because I, I believe that young entrepreneurs who are coming out of college and want to start a business and want to go into business are prime areas that we can, we can do that with. And the colleges and universities are kind of the places where we got people kind of corral so we can communicate with those more effectively. Okay. I thank you so much. Oh, thank you. And if you got any additional ideas outside of what we're doing, we, we are real happy to, to take advice or, or any type of help we got. All right. Anyone else? Okay, look, I want to thank you also for what you're doing. You keep the job up. I think you've been here how many months now? Uh, seven months, eight months, yes. Eight months, yes. yes. So you're doing a very good job. I just want to commend you on that. Thank but you. whatever you do, we just want you to continue to keep the council abreast of everything, okay? Yes, That's where we can work it all together. And anything that we can do, I'm quite sure we'll be right there for you. Thank you. I okay. Appreciate, appreciate you. And one good thing, the schools, that's very important. All of these colleges, everything else, because first of all, we want to kind of put them in business and we want to keep them here in the city of Memphis. We don't that's want them important. leaving here, opening up a business. We want to keep them right here. So yeah, stay right there with those schools. Appreciate you. And then also put Rhodes College in there also. All we'll our universities, that. please do that. Thank yeah. you. Appreciate you all for coming today. Okay. Thank you all. It's now 9.30, and I'd like to call the Parks and Environmental uh, Committee to order. Uh, could we please have a roll call? Present. Councilwoman Johnson? Aye. Councilwoman Dockery? Present. Councilman Jones? Here. Councilman Ford? Present. Chair Warren? Also present. We have two items on our agenda today. Item number one is a resolution to accept $4,921,000 in pledge donations from the University of Memphis. Auxiliary Services Foundation from private donors and 
a $50,000 donation from Fleming Architects and Grinder Tabor Grinder in support of the construction of the new Leftwich Tennis Center, CIP Project Number PK-03005. This is District 5, Super District 9, sponsored by the administration. Could I have a motion and a second, please? Second. Uh, moved by Ford, seconded by Jones. Uh, do we have anyone to comment on this from administration? Chief, you have the floor. Good morning. Doug McGowan, Chief Operating Officer, City of Memphis, 791 North Graham. So uh, this is accepting pledges that were from private donors for the Leftwich Tennis Center. For those, just to refresh everybody's memory, there's about $15 million of private pledges that are going to the Leftwich Tennis Center. Uh, you have already accepted $2.5 million. This accepts another $4.9 million. And in this resolution, it gives us the authority to accept up to the full $15 million in pledges. So we are on track with the pledges that are coming in. Contrary to what you may have heard from some folks who uh, are critics of the project, the pledges are being fulfilled. This is $7.4 million of private money that we are accepting for this project. We will accept the rest of the $15 million as it comes in. Uh, we will be coming to you soon, uh, accepting some money from the University of Memphis to match the city's investment so that we can continue and get this project open uh, in the spring. So. Uh, we are on track, the project is on time and on budget, and the cash flow is coming in uh, from donors, uh, from the university, and from sponsors in order for us to build a wonderful world-class tennis center. Uh, Chief, is there a reason that you want us to go ahead and accept now future donations coming in as opposed to letting us know when they get here and when you need to bring them in? Well, what we can do with this resolution, it gives us the ability to accept up to that, so I don't have to come to you just to ask to accept the money, but I will certainly give you an update. And what I have to do is ask you to appropriate the money, and I will we'll accept this grant, and then I will come to you saying, I need to appropriate X number of dollars based on the pledges that have come in. So you will always know how much has come in because I'm going to ask you to appropriate it against the project. Um, so when you do the, the appropriations, you'll just give us the update on yeah, how much has come in. And that saves us, you know, when the next, if coming every meeting, accepting another pledge and another fulfilled pledge. And as you know, that's going to come over time. So excellent. Do we have any questions from council members? Seeing none, all those in favor, please say aye. aye. Any opposed? The ayes have it. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Chief. Item number two is the resolution to approve expenditures in the amount of $200,000 for renovation of the Little Red Schoolhouse, District 5, Super District 9, sponsored by administration. Uh, do I have a motion and a second? Move it. Move Jones. Seconded by Dockery. Uh, do we have someone from administration to speak? Yeah. Chief, go ahead, Chief Walker. You have the floor. As always, Councilman, I thank you for the uh, for the position upgrade. Um, you got it. The, um, Director, excuse me. You're good. You're okay. good, Dr. Warren. Um, nice so haircut, by the way. It we, looks like you're trying to get to be chief. <laughs> <laughs> no, that means I got to go to meetings on Fridays. I'm good. Okay. I'm good. Uh, no, uh, as you know, we brought this to committee uh, last uh, meeting. Uh, the Little Red Schoolhouse, or President Island Schoolhouse as it's uh, more commonly known, is believed to be the last one-room schoolhouse in Shelby County where uh, segregated education took place. Um, children of all ages from 31 families of sharecroppers attended the school, which only had one teacher. Uh, these funds, uh, HCD, uh, using federal funds, uh, was able to pay for the design and move of the building uh, from its current location uh, over on Flickr uh, behind the new fire headquarters uh, over to the Mosh uh, grounds. Uh, the funds that you are appropriating today, with any luck, uh, will allow for the construction and, and modification of the building to make it an educational facility. Um, where there can be historical opportunities uh, for folks to come in and, and, and tour the, the site. Uh, I also have with me Kevin, um, who is the executive director of MOSH, if you have any more detailed questions about the background of the, of the facility. But again, the administration is in full support of this, thinks it's a really good opportunity for us to create um, a bit of history that people should be aware of. Chief, do you by any chance happen to know why it was moved to the fire department property, oh. and was it used in fire actually, training at some actually, point? I've got, I've got, I've got a note here. Uh, upon closing in the 60s, it was originally stored at Liberty Land, 
um, and eventually moved to the fire training facility. Um, again, I think it just sort of bounced around. Uh, so everyone knew it was important. They just figured a place to put it and didn't know exactly where it was going to end up, but we knew we needed to keep it. Yeah, and I love this, I, and I'm glad that the people who made these notes for me uh, feels like they had talked to you. There have been various restoration efforts over the years, including by a group of students at East High that never came to realization. Um, but again, when this opportunity came up, uh, it's a wonderful thing that we have a cultural science and history museum uh, that's a part of this city because the folks at Mosh jumped at the opportunity, brought in uh, the same architect who is doing the historical renovation work at Gaston, uh, to oversee this, uh, which which gives me a lot of confidence that, that this will be the time that it goes through. Excellent. Thank you, Chief. Uh, thank you, Mr. Director. Uh, do we have uh, any questions from anybody? If not, all those in favor of uh, moving this to Mosh, please say aye. aye. Any opposed? All right. Thank you very much. That passes. Um, do we have any further business? If not, this committee is adjourned. Thank you.
Good morning. It is 9.45 in the September 27th. Um, this Transportation Committee is now called to order. Would you please call the roll, Mr. Wilson? Councilwoman Dockery. Here. Councilman Warren. Present. Councilman Jones. Here. Councilman Ford. Present. And Chair Logan. Present, present. Colleagues, we have one item on the agenda, a monthly update from MATA, all council districts requested by Councilman Canale. We now are ready for your presentation, and if you are, please um, give us your name and your address for the record, and you may have the floor. Good morning, Bakara Malden, Chief of Staff, Memphis Area Transit Authority. Bakara Malden, Chief of Staff, Memphis Area Transit Authority, 1370 Levy Road, Memphis, Tennessee. Um, thank you, and uh, thank you for allowing us to present this morning. I'd also like to recognize our CEO, Mr. Gary Rosenfeld, who is also here with us this morning as well. So I'm pleased to present our monthly update, and we're going to start with a little bit of good news. Uh, we're starting with our labor needs category. Uh, even though we still have a lot of ground to cover, if you look at our numbers from last month uh, to, well, from August to September, I guess, you can see that we're, we're picking up a little ground. We've picked up a few additional people, but we still have a lot more people to hire. Um, and I think this is largely because Mr. Rosenfeld has really um, instituted a bit of a full court press when it comes to recruiting. He has literally uh, called in every department head and had all of us thinking about what role do we play in the greater recruitment conversation. And once those conversations started internally, we're now beginning to see some movement in terms of recruiting. But there's more work to be done, of course. We have our route ridership rankings. As you see, our 42 cross town with uh, over 27,000 uh, boardings is the uh, highest utilized route, uh, all the way down to the Walnut Grove route, I can't see, to the Walnut Grove route with 1,213. And so we have all of the routes in between. And as you see, the top three, they kind of fluctuate between 42, 36, and 50. And uh, for this last month, of course, 42 cross town was the uh, highest utilized route. And next, we have our ridership on all of our modes. And of course, our fixed route service, our motor bus, of course, is the uh, most utilized mode of transportation for MATA with two, 204,425. But each of our other modes are trending very well. Uh, they're trending positively. We had over 30,000 boardings with our steel rail trolley, uh, 10,793 on MATA Plus. Zone 1 in ready, 9,856 groove. Groove is coming along very steadily, and it is really, really beginning to take off in popularity. That ridership is 6,460, followed by Zone 2 at 1,207 boardings, down to Zone 3 at 285 boardings. So if you were to compare where we are this year, compared to where we were in years past, you'll see that we're right coming up right behind where our ridership was in FY19, which is really good and probably I think ahead of the ahead of the trend in terms of, of ridership across the country. Um, I think that uh, it looks like our ridership is beginning to come back strong. And we anticipate that as we continue to roll out the new technology and do more community engagement, that those ridership numbers are going to get even stronger. And so we fully expect to get our ridership back to the pre-pandemic levels. And of course, as we talked about our ready ridership zone one, which is Southwest Memphis, continues to be our strongest performing zone uh, with, again, 9,856 boardings. Uh, zone two is still coming along strongly, followed by zone three. Our on-time performance, 
Uh, the demand response, which is the MATA Plus on time performance, is 95.3%, followed by our steel wheel trolley at 85.4%. Followed by our fixed route service, which is 56.3. And we are doubling down on our fixed route service. We are working to try to get those on-time performance numbers up. We have brought on new technology, and we're kind of going through the process of, of integrating that technology and making sure that we are getting the appropriate data. And so we expect to see those fixed route numbers go up uh, because of the things that Mr. Rosenfeld has instituted uh, for our operations team. For our assessment center, we've gotten a lot of questions lately about how many assessments we are doing on a monthly basis, and it shows we've answered at least 403 calls in the assessment center, uh, and that we've done 129 in-office assessments, 25 in-home assessments, we provided 45 extensions, we mailed 97 applications, and we re recertified 148 I'm sorry, cars mailed, 148 cars were mailed. In terms of our ADA events, we've had ADA training for new hires on August the 5th as well as August the 26th. Uh, and for our DBEs, we have recertified five DBEs in the DBE program and we've had one new certification. For our Go 901 mobile, we've had um, 6,396 orders. We've had 12,000, we've sold 12,953 tickets, and sales are going strong at $21,682 for Go 901 mobile. We are continuing to test our streetcar. Uh, we are looking forward to the day that we can roll those out, but we are going through, continuing to go through a series of tests for, uh, for our streetcar, and so we are very excited, very, very excited about that. We are rolling that out for the last trolley night, and so people will be able to kind of look at it, see it, touch it, all of that. We're continuing our partnership with Whole Child Strategies. We've had over two, well, 2,892 passengers and we've operated for 134 service days. And if you recall, that's the partnership with Whole Child Strategies to take people to the grocery store to try to, I guess, build that bridge between some of the residents and the, the grocery stores, because we do unfortunately have food deserts. And so this is just one program uh, that we are partnering with uh, just to try to fill that gap. In communication, we've had uh, our local viewership has been 598,074, and the ad equivalency is over $25,000 in ads uh, because of the viewership that we've had locally. Um, our top, our, I guess our top light article, of course, is uh, all of the good news that we had about the funding that we received federally. That was a very popular, uh, that was a very popular media hit that we got. And so that's our highest ranking media hit for the last month. We've had 91,853 Facebook page uh, reaches. Uh, we've had 2,499 Facebook page visits. And then we've had over 2,000 Rod Matter Twitter impressions, which also includes at Rod Matter CEO as well. So you can follow Mr. Rosenfeld on Twitter. Uh, he does go out there and post, and you can see what he is up to leading our agency. For digital marketing, uh, we have 41,000 website visits, and that's the www.matatransit.com website. And of course, most people access that using their uh, telephones, so they do mobile access. Uh, the top tracker hits, of course, for Matter Tracker uh, is 20,613. So people are beginning to catch on to the Matter Tracker. And for people that may not be familiar, you can go to our website and actually find the answer to that question, that age old question of 
where's my bus? You can now track your bus on our website with using the Matter Tracker. And so it's beginning to catch on, but we've got a lot more people that we need to reach. So at Go901 Transit, we've had 9,328 website sessions, and of course, most people access Go901 Transit using their mobile phone. And we've had 161 email signups. And we are in our community engagement efforts, encouraging people to sign up, uh, to sign up for Go901 Transit and to get Omni alerts and all of that. So we're continuing to get the word out. And so we hope that in the months to come, that number will go up and up and up. We had two community events this month at a Red Robin Back to School Bash and at the White Haven Library Pop-Up Shop. Uh, the event goers were basically, they were shown how to use the Matter Tracker. So again, we're continuing to push that information out into the community so that people can use their phones to answer that age old question of where's my bus? And that concludes our report for this month. We'll be happy to entertain any questions that you may have at this time. Thank you for your presentation. Are there any council members that want to be recognized? Any questions or comments? Seeing none, this meeting is a, is there any other business that needs to come before this committee? All right, thank you again for your presentation. This meeting is adjourned.
Uh, Ms. Owens, would you conduct roll call, please? Here. Councilwoman Dockery. Here. Councilman Ford. Councilwoman Robinson. Councilman Canale. Councilwoman Johnson. Chair Jones. Present. Uh, colleagues, we have a number of items on our agenda for today. The first is the Memphis City Council Community Grant Program Fiscal 23 presentations. This is all council districts. Uh, so we have colleagues, we have presenters today uh, who will be presenting. These are fund, these are nonprofit organizations that apply after we reopened or extended or happen to be new uh, applicants. So the first one that we're going to hear from today is the Memphis Dental Society Charitable Fund. So is there a representative who will be presenting on this organization's behalf? Good morning, sir. Good morning, Chairman Jones. Um, I'm Dr. Stuart Hudsmith, and um, I'm the clinical chairman for the uh, Mid-South Mission of Mercy. Um, you'll see our PowerPoint presentation here, but um, our Mid-South Mission of Mercy, and I want to define it for you, it's a two-day annual event that the dentist of Memphis, in conjunction with lay volunteers, put on to treat the underserved patients in all council areas, in all districts in Shelby County. Um, we have, we started in 2016. Uh, to be very honest with you, we didn't know how many uh, patients we would see. Uh, we didn't know the demand was as great as it was in the Metroplex. But the very first year we set up with the anticipation we might see Seven, eight hundred patients. We ended up seeing 2,000 patients in two days. Um, since that time, uh, with the exception of 20, uh, 21, when, 2020, when our COVID problem uh, was in effect, we have treated about 11,000 patients in 10 days of service and done about $7 million in free dental services for those patients. We base our fees off the 10 care fee schedule, so they're, they're very conservative estimates. Um, we make sure that each patient is taken care of. I think it's uh, important to know our event is located at Bellevue Baptist Church. They've been very gracious to us to allow us to use those facilities. And um, when these patients show up, they show up almost 24 hours in advance for their services to get in line. Uh, over the years, we've learned how to make that work better uh, through systems. We have a lot of lay volunteers. <coughs> for all those 11,000 patients we've seen, we have had 10,000 volunteers to help with that. Um, the dentist of Memphis and hygienist of Memphis assistants have been very great. Uh, each year, this particular program costs a little over uh, $200,000 for supplies. We don't, we don't pay for any, you know, administrative services or anything. We don't pay Bellevue for the facility. They probably donate who knows how much in kind. I mean, it's, it's very gracious on their part. But um, the dentists of Memphis themselves, even though we provide our services, have given almost a third of the money for supplies each year. And so what we've seen and is build it and they will come. We had no idea that the underserved population in Memphis needed dental services so bad. Um, our plan is to continue our services um, for as long as we possibly can. Uh, simply, it's, you know, it's a funding issue. I'm the clinical chairman. Um, Mitch Godad is the CEO. He's a periodontist here in town. Uh, I'm a general dentist here in town. I actually practiced down not too far from Dr. Warren uh, for a lot of years. And uh, we've, we've had a, just a great time serving the under, underserved of, of Memphis. Um, if you 
if you want to look at the slides, great. I mean, it's fabulous to look at them, but I think the impact that you really need to know is that I had no idea how much of a homecoming it would be for the dentist that volunteer there. You see, we don't often get the opportunity to give back. Dr. Hudspeth, yes. uh, let me see if any council members, we have some other uh, grantees that we have to hear from this morning. I want sure. to see if any council members had any questions of you. Please. Uh, Councilman Colvett. Thank you. Thank, uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman, Dr. Hudspeth. Thank you for coming. Uh, colleagues, If uh, when are we going to do this again? Is it March? This is January uh, 21st. January 21st. We moved it this past year to um, April 1st because we had a COVID spike in January and wanted to ensure the safety of all our volunteers and patients. Okay. Um, Colleagues, if you get the chance to join me and Dr. Hudspeth uh, at Bellevue for this, it is to see 11,000 patients, to serve 11,000 underserved Memphians. And it's everything from simple teeth cleaning, teeth removal. I think you even have mobile x-ray units. Um, and you've gotten the efficiency down. Uh, it is... It is really something to behold, colleagues. I hope you'll join me in January to go out and actually see this, but it's not until you see it in practice and realize how they can get all of these folks through and you realize the impact that they have on our community. Um, I, for one, strongly support Dr. Hudspeth uh, in Mid-South. I always called it Mid-South Mission of Mercy. Mid-South Dental, uh, but I hope colleagues, you will join me in January and just give me a couple hours and let Dr. Uh, Hudspeth tour you through it. Thank you. Thank you. Any other colleagues who want to be recognized? Dr. Warren. Yeah, I don't think many people really understand the importance of dental health to just general health. And by doing this, I mean, it really is helping the general health of our community dramatically. Uh, and uh, colleagues, if you have any money left over, we should probably strongly consider adding some additional money to this. This is very, very important for the health of the community. I'm just wondering how many of the people that you see do you have to do extractions and how many teeth can you actually salvage because of this? We restore as many as we can. We took out extracted almost 2,000 teeth this last year. Um, unfortunately, these patients have put other things ahead of dentistry. You know, they're underserved. They're putting the family first, the car first, the job first. And, and we're doing what we can to get them, the, take infection away from them, to get them out of pain. And a lot of times we're able to replace front teeth where they are very self-conscious and, and can't smile. Uh, obviously affecting their ability to get jobs and that sort of thing. So it's it's life-changing both from a health and a mental perspective. Okay. Thank you again. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Ford. Yeah. Uh, I don't know what I have left, but I will be part of it. I just want you to know that I will be giving also. Okay. Thank you. Thank you very much. Okay. Thank you. Thank you for your presentation, Dr. Hudsmith. We, uh, so much, there's a Chairman resolution Jones. that we'll be voting on momentarily, but we have other presenters to hear from. Thank you, Thank you for the presentation. Uh, next, we'll have the Memphis Health Center. And Ms. Owens, would you put three minutes on the clock, please? Good morning, and thank you all so much for this opportunity. My name is Marilyn Barres, and I'm the Chief Executive Officer for Memphis Health Center. Next slide, please. The mission of Memphis Health Center is to, to improve community health and well-being for the citizens of Shelby and Fayette Counties. Next slide, please. The next slide is just ba some uh, basic information uh, on Memphis Health Center. I just wanted to make reference that we are located in District 3, 6, and Super District 8. Next slide, please. Memphis Health Center is requesting $150,000 to demolish a building adjacent to our property. Uh, the address is 316 Crump. We're located um, at 360 EH Crump. Next slide, please. We're requesting funding to demolish a deteriorating 
lighted building adjacent to our main site um, to create additional parking for patients and employees. Memphis Health Center has been around since 1970. We offer an array of medical services. Over 90% of our patients are 200% below the federal poverty level. Next slide, please. Memphis Health Center provided care to 23,331 patients in 2021, generating uh, 61,000 encounters. Of that, over 14,000 of those individuals received services at our Crump site. Just wanted to uh, bring focus that our plan is to protect our patients and our employees. I'm sure that all of you all have heard of the Metro. We have been experiencing so many problems for that, from that Metro uh, Plaza. Uh, about two months ago, there was a shootout it resulted in shooting out four of our employees' cars. The next three days, there was another shootout whereby our patients had to take cover on the side of our building on Crump. Our goal is to tear down that building, fence it up, have a security booth, have cameras, and make it more safe for our patients and our employees. Next slide, please. Just talking just a little bit about Memphis Health Center and our partnerships, hospitals, clinics, foundations, schools, churches, and the like. Over 75 uh, community events are held every year. We uh, target individuals who are homeless, individuals who are HIV infected, and individuals who are in need of our primary care services. Basically, next slide, the solution is to tear down that building, um, for parking, build it up, make it safe, make it presentable. And we are hopeful that you all will support us in this activity. Thank you all so much. Thank you, Ms. Burris. Uh, colleagues, is, uh, Council, Councilwoman Dock. Hear me? Can you? Okay. Thank you, Chairman. I didn't get your name. I'm so sorry. My name is Marilyn Burress, B-U-R-R-E-S-S. Ms. Burress, good, good morning to you. Thank you. Good morning. So, probably because I was asking Councilwoman a question about you, let me just say um, congratulations on your work that you do over there. My personal doctor outside of Dr. Warren, Dr. Lawrence left his, per his private practice to come and serve with you all. Um, truly a servant. So I will be more than willing to get with you and support you however I can. Keep up the good work because you all have done massive work over there. Very proud of you. Thank you so much. Yes, ma'am. Thank you. Thank you. Councilwoman Robinson. Yes, I want to thank you for being here today, Ms. Barres. I support the Memphis Health Center as well. And I do have a card because I uh, visit their clinic when I can't get to uh, my regular doctor. Uh, and they have really done an awesome job. They have a, uh, remodeled their building. Uh, they wanted the plaza next door to them, but that didn't work out. So they were able to purchase the property next door. And I was hoping some of my council members could help me work through, you know, what we can do as a city to help them to demolish that building as well. Thank you. Thank you. Colleagues, uh, Council, Councilman Ford. Uh, when you said the name, you know, I had to be part of that. I'm willing to be able to help. And then I know Metro Center. There's some things that's supposed to be going on with Metro Center. So we need to get with you also after that and trying to clean that part up, everything else. But the history of the health center goes back to my brother, James. Okay, who? He's a doctor over there at that health center. He stayed there for a while and he kind of helped. So hey, it's, it's a big history and y'all have helped so many different people. So hey, I asked all my colleagues, hey, let's be part of the Memphis Health Center, okay? Thank, thank you, thank you so you. much. Mm -hmm. Seeing no other questions, uh, thank you for the presentation, thank Ms. You. Burris. Have a good thank rest you. of the day. Uh, next we'll have Urban Promise 901. Good morning. Good morning. 
I just want to acknowledge um, my son, who is uh, took the place of another um, constituent of Urban Promise, and he, Brianna told told us that we would need someone to move through the slides, and he is a sixth grade student at New Hope Christian Academy in Fraser. Okay, uh, okay. He's out of school today for his school visit um, at MUS today, so um, he had the opportunity since he was out of school to come early before his school visit. So thank you for allowing him to be a part of this time. Urban Promise 901 is uh, a mentoring and tutoring organization that was founded right before COVID began in 2019. Urban Promise 901's mission is to improve the academic achievement, self-esteem, social competence, and avoidance of problem high risk behavior by providing a connection with a mentor who works to help youth achieve their potential. Next slide, please. We actually began, that's a typo, 2019 was when we began and 2000 uh, was the year we received our 501c3 during the midst of COVID as a response to many of our students in our area not having access to um, actual opportunities to connect with their online learning. So we began, became a hub for that. Next slide, please. We are in District 4 as well as Super District 8, but we serve a constituency um, through our connections with um, the Raleigh Community Center as well as McFarland Community Center and a White Haven Community Center. So we are north, south, east, and west. We partner with 20, 20 schools to provide support, mentoring, and um, tutoring. Um, our funding amount requested is actually 25,000 uh, for this year. We had the opportunity during a walkthrough with uh, Councilwoman uh, Jamita Swearingen and Commissioner Milton on last year. We were in Orange Mound doing a walkthrough together and we didn't even know okay, about the community grant, um, but they told us about it and said, you need to apply. So this is why, that's why we are here today. Next slide, please. Urban Promise 901 exists to stop the cradle to prison pipeline that exists in Memphis and in other urban cities uh, as close to the beginning of that pipeline as possible. During COVID-19 school closures, up 901 provided a safe haven for children and students who needed a place to go to to access online school and academic support and needed help with their schoolwork when schools were closed. Up 901 understands that early intervention prevents the onset of delinquent behavior and supports the development of a youth's assets and resilience. While many past approaches focus on remediating visible and or long-standing disruptive behavior, research shows that prevention and early intervention are more effective. And we've partnered with St. Jude. Our students were able to do a virtual um, conversation with Dr. Downing, the CEO of St. Jude, who was partnering with us to do job shadowing for our children. We believe that children cannot be what they can't see. So a child will never be an architect until they meet one. They'll never be a doctor unless they meet one. And they will never be successful until they meet people in our communities who are succeeding and being um, uh, proficient in supporting our communities. Thank you. Colleagues, are there any questions for this organization? Okay. Seeing none, Mr. Litzy, thanks. Thank you for your presentation. Next, we'll have the Zion Community Project. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and to members of the council. It's an honor for me to be present with you today to make this this presentation. Um, I understand how brief the time period is, so I will be equally brief. Uh, if you'll move to the next slide. I am Tyrone Davis. I'm the chair of the board of directors for the Zion Community Project, and I've worked with this project for 20 years now. We are a 501c3 not-for-profit organization in the state of, of Tennessee. And our goal is the restoring and maintaining and preserving of the Zion Christian Cemetery located on South Parkway because it is historical and it has educational purposes that ensures the preservation of our community's history and to combat deterioration of its community. Next slide, please. 
Just a few things about us. Our organization was founded in uh, 1992. The property was leased to us. We we're in our second 25-year uh, lease, lease period. Um, and we are located in District 4 and Super District 8. Uh, and although we indicate 800 to 1,000 citizens being served, we serve a much larger number. Next slide, please. Our request is for $15,000 to assist us with our, the problem of maintaining this property to avoid blight, crime, and uh, debris accumulation. Uh, next slide, please. This is a 15-acre cemetery with more than 30,000 people interred. It was founded in 1876 by free slaves and it has been, it, it is the oldest African-American cemetery, a community cemetery in Memphis. It has buried there many notable citizens of this, commu of this community that contributed significantly uh, during the post-Civil War period. We have secured thousands of you know, volunteers from across the country, from the Illinois College, Rhodes College, Kent State University in Ohio, City College in New York, Howard University, and in addition to churches and other organizations, even from Texas, Arkansas, and other locations. They've all volunteered in our cemetery to help us keep this cleared. Next slide, please. We're using the support of these volunteers in order to try to improve this community. When we began work in it, we pulled out, um, we, we, we pulled out sofas, mattresses, basketball goals, sex paraphernalia, drug paraphernalia, and this was a blight to the community. We've done this work with volunteers. We're asking your support to help us as we continue forward with this project that we might make a difference in the future and not only eliminate blight, but as we improve the cemetery, we want to make it a tourism stop that it will encourage more people to come to Memphis and therefore benefit our community through tourism. Thank you so much for giving me this opportunity to present. I stand ready for any questions. Thank you. Colleagues, are there any questions for? Yes. yes. Okay, so we'll start with Councilwoman Johnson, followed by Councilman Ford and Councilwoman Dockery. And Dr. Warren. Presentation. I've become somewhat familiar with this organization and the mission that they're on. Also, I think it's important that we realize in order for this city to move forward, we're going to have to get more programs like this taking place. This is an opportunity for individuals to begin to learn about the history of the city. It's also an opportunity for various groups to start to working together on a particular cause. This is a setting where you have young folks working, college folks, elderly people, everybody coming out making a difference. We're also addressing blight in the city. This is another opportunity where blight did exist and they're actually coming out making the necessary improvements to that lot. Uh, as he said also, the thought of it being an economic vehicle for us, for it to become a tourist site. People coming in wanting to know who are these individuals and what did they actually contribute to this city as well as to this nation. So I'm going to be supporting it. I'm asking for the support of the other council people in regards to this particular cemetery. And, uh, you know, cemeteries go through a lot of changes. And after a period of time, the boards disappear. There's no one there to take care of those cemeteries. So I commend you for cleaning it up as well as blight. But I commend you for respecting those who have passed on. And we, they, they're deserving of that due respect. Thank you so much, sir. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Councilwoman Johnson. Councilman Ford. Thanks, Chairman. Uh, question cleaning up the cemetery. We appropriated money for your cemetery over here on, that's, that's at Donovan and Parkway, right? Yes, right in the curve. That's in the historic I'm cemetery. I'm not aware of that in the last 20 years. So. Huh? You're not aware of what? aware of any funds being appropriated. Okay, but the city of Memphis should have been cutting 
that particular cemetery. That particular cemetery should have been cut in Rose Hill Cemetery. It should have been cut in uh, three other cemeteries. Have they not cut that particular cemetery? I need to know because the funds were put in place to take care of that particular cemetery. We uh, have, the reason why I'm asking that because I need to go to the city and make sure that, hey, they give those funds that was provided. We did that, okay? For those particular cemeteries, Rose Hill, all of these particular cemeteries was four cemeteries, and you all were one of the cemeteries. So if they have not done that, I want to know why haven't they, because they told me they had. Okay? And I want to make sure you get those funds. Okay? Thank you, sir. Yeah, so please let me know what's at the city, and I'm going to when they come, because I don't see anybody out there right now, I'll bring that issue up to date with them. But they're supposed to maintain those cemeteries all year. We put funds out there, okay? So I need to make sure. And if not, I mean, like I said, I will make sure they will, the city will be helping you, because that should have been going on not just this year, last year, all the rest of where we put those funds in place. Okay. But they were supposed to have been cutting, taking care of all that. There was one cemetery that they just didn't because it was in such a bad shape. We're still working on that, but funds were there for all of those things. So I want to make sure you get your funds. Thank, Thank you. Thank you sir. here. Okay. Thank you, Councilman Ford. Councilwoman Dockery. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. Um, Mr. Davis, let me say, my, the council does not know um, the, the history that I have with the cemetery. And it was an honor again seeing you today, knowing that um, the council doesn't know this either, that my great grandfather was the first black man to own a bills business on Bill Street and is buried in Mount Zion Cemetery. And the fact that my aunt for years has sat on the board uh, as we have laid a few people in our family to rest in that cemetery. So, uh, and I do know that it is, it has been blighted. I know that you all have been working and um, to answer Mr. Ford's, Councilman Ford's uh, question, uh, because I've had to help cut the cemetery a few times. Uh, truthfully, uh, they, you all don't care if it's a girl or a boy cutting the grass, just getting it done. So I do want you to know that I support you and I am here to service you, sir, um, outside of council as well as just as a servant to you. Thank you again for all that you've done for my family at the cemetery. Thank you. Councilman Warren. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Davis, for being here. Uh, I'd just like to say I, I will be donating to this organization and my wife is on their board uh, but I don't think it's necessarily conflict thank you okay. thank you uh, seeing no other council members that want to make a comment dr. Davis thank you for your presentation and the work that you do next colleagues we will be taking up a resolution to amend the council Fiscal year 23 grant allocations, all council districts sponsored by Councilman Covet, and there's a request for same night minutes. Mr. Covet, will you move it, please? I move it. Is there a second? Okay. Any one? Okay. Councilwoman Logan. I just wanted, wanted to make sure I noted that I wanted to um, increase one of the ones that I had on there. Okay. Well, yours is coming up after okay. this. So okay, we, right. we're in the process of. Okay looking at the individual allocations now. Okay, and so this you. is the one for, well, just for the record, uh, Mr. Covet, will you uh, describe what this grant, al grant allocation is? Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Chairman. This is a $50,000 request. And I keep calling it Mid-South Mission of Mercy, but it's Mid-South Dental Society uh, for their January 10-day 11,000 patient event, uh, dentistry event at Bellevue Baptist, and I so move. Okay. Has been moved and seconded. Uh, Mr. Chair. Yes. Can, is this the time when we, if we wanted to add our funds to it, we could? Yes, it would be. So you would. I would like to add 5,000 of my funds to this. Okay. So we'll have a, a resolution. What we'll do, we'll have a resolution from you that we'll hear this afternoon. And that's when the amendment will be made to it. So if there's, you know, for the ones that we've heard today, it looks like there's an interest in adding to some of the presenters today. So what I would ask for you to do is get with your research analyst 
and have a resolution prepared that we'll hear in regular council meeting today and approve those items. So, Dr. Warren, uh, I'd like to ask if anyone else would like to have uh, make a contribution to this organization. I believe, Council Count, COVID. I believe Councilman Ford wishes to give some money and I'll get with him uh, to make sure I get the amount and I intend to contribute. Council Lady Dockery also wishes to contribute. I'll get with her today. And Council Councilor Lady Robinson. Robinson, I'll get with her today. Any other players? Me. Chairman is in and I will get with all you guys today to bring up the split for a 3.30 main meeting and in, injected into the resolution. Sounds good. Okay. All those in favor of approving the donation of yet to be determined of the, but at least $50,000 for the Memphis Dental Society Charitable Fund, please signify by saying aye. Aye. Any opposed? That item passes. Next, colleagues, is a resolution to amend the fiscal year 23 grant allocations, all council districts. This is sponsored by Councilwoman Robinson. Councilwoman Robinson, you're recognized. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I think I have several here this afternoon. Yes. And, and I just ask that we move all of them at the same time. Okay, so okay. I'll read into the record the allocations that Councilwoman Robinson has recommended has been the Blue City Cultural Center, for 5,000, the NAACP Memphis Branch, 5,000, Feed the Needy, 5,000, Memphis Health Center, 5,000, and the Africa and April Cultural Awareness Festival, 5,000. So the total amount for this is 25,000. Councilwoman Johnson. Uh, for clarity, if we had other people, we were making recommendations and that those names were not called out. As long as they're on the resolution today, is that okay? Repeat that again, please. Okay. I had a resolution for four additional uh -huh. agencies that I wish to contribute to. I did not get a chance to call those names out, or did you automatically make that assumption mm -hmm. of how we're going to do Yours this? Yours is, you're number six on here, so you have an opportunity to do so. We're on I item number Robinson. three now. Okay, you jump. Okay, I see. Okay. Yep, so you, you'll have the opportunity to do so. Okay. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Most welcome. Uh, thank you for that, Councilwoman Robinson. Is there, are there any other questions on this item that's presented by Councilwoman Robinson? Seeing none, all, the, all of those in favor, please signify by saying aye. Aye. I thought aye. she was further down. Any opposed? That item passes. Thank you. Next, item number four is a resolution to amend the Council 23, fiscal year 23 grant allocations. This is sponsored by Councilwoman Logan. Councilwoman Logan, the floor is yours, ma'am. Um, Chair, I have uh, since been here wanting to contribute to some of the others, so I was, I'll was bring up the other resolutions this evening. Is that what you were saying, dude? Well, so yeah. what you can do, what you can do, you can, uh, you already have a resolution prepared. So you can amend yours, the one that we have before us now, with the organizations and the amounts. The only thing is I for this evening. look at the amount, and I'll just bring those this evening. Okay, um, so the one that you have on the record now, this resolution that we have before us now, is Feed the Needed for 2500 And I'm going to change that. Amend that, that one. one? Yes. Okay, do you, no two. idea if do you have any dollar amounts for any others right now? Not right now. Okay, so right. we'll approve uh, this, this one. So moved. Thank you. Okay. Second. Has moved and seconded that we approve the grant allocation yet to be determined. The final amount, we'll have that for this afternoon's meeting. And this is a request for same night minutes, of course. All those in favor, please signify by saying aye. Aye. Any opposed? That item passes. Next, we'll have a resolution to amend the council fiscal year 23 grant allocations. This is sponsored by Councilman Warren. It is a request for same night minutes. Councilman Warren, the floor is yours. So moved. Um, I believe this is a resolution for feed the needy for 5,000 and I'll be adding other documents to that or other organizations by the time we have. Okay. I need a second. Is there a second? second. Okay, seconded by Councilwoman Dockery. Uh, seeing no other council members that want to speak on this item, all those in favor, please signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? That item passes. 
Mr. Chair, yes. may I ask a question? Yes, ma'am. On this evening, is it possible we can just get a spreadsheet like we did originally so we don't have to go one individual at a time? That takes to up too much time. Can we just do a spreadsheet and, and do the approval that way this evening? Well, uh, for the... For these items? Yes. Well, uh, this will be on fiscal consent. So what we'll do, we'll just hear it as it as, it, as it's presented. Okay. okay. Thank you. Uh, next, we'll have a resolution to amend the council twenty three uh, fiscal year twenty three grant allocations. This is sponsored by Councilwoman Johnson. Councilwoman Johnson. Thank you, Chair. I was a little premature before, but I saw Robinson for some reason at the end. I said, "Oh, he skipped me." Uh, the, I, the agencies, organizations which I'm recommending that I would like to uh, support have already been here this morning. We heard from the last one, Zion Community Project. So I'm with Feed the Needy for 15,000, Zion Community Project for five, Africa in April for 10,000, and Breaking a Stronghold for five, and Leah House, Layman in Action uh, for 5,000. And okay. I so move. Is there a second? Okay, so the total of that item is $40,000. All those in favor, please signify by saying aye. Aye. Any opposed? Okay, that item passes. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Councilwoman Johnson. Uh, next, we'll have a discussion of, of the fiscal year 23 CIP capital safety development funding, all council districts sponsored by yours truly. So is there anyone to speak on this item? Uh, Boy, I sure the <laughs> uh, good morning, Manny Berlin with the Division of Engineering. So I, I guess um, this is a uh, council uh, agenda to discuss the allocation and appropriation of the funds relative to the traffic safety development uh, project that y'all, um, that the council during budget approved. So yes. We're here to uh, answer any questions you may have. Okay, so colleagues, uh, this sort of came about as a result of the last meeting. I think it was brought to our, t we were talking about some safety measures, uh, particularly when we talked about East Parkway and Sam Cooper. And so we, it was uh, brought to our attention that there's some council funds that had been set forth in last year's budget, but we never acted upon it. Maybe we thought that the administration was going to bring something to us. The administration thought we were going to bring something to them. So I just wanted to have this discussion and have us uh, to see what has been presented and recommended to us that was just handed out here for some of those. Um, Councilman Carla. Thank you, Chair. Yeah, I think this is great. I, I, I agree. I, I hate that we, I, no one's trying to throw stones talking past each other, but you know, I know that Councilwoman Easter Thomas had a couple of schools in particular. I know Council Ford had one or two, but ultimately, I was like, I just had assumed that that over the years that requests had come in, there were probably some zones we knew about. So I'm very happy that you guys presented this list to us. And one of the things that I'll go ahead and note without seeing a pie chart is it looks like you guys tried to balance out pro rata per district so everybody felt like they were they were getting something. Although I noticed that, you know, I see the super districts, but I understand that those are just secondary, <laughs> Councilman Ford. <laughs> Indeed. Um, so anyway, I thank you to both um, Manny we and... Secondary if they can uh, double things. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> so, so anyway, thank you to both Manny and to Randall, um, the city's uh, engineer and the traffic, the city's senior traffic engineer. I, I look forward to the discussion. Okay. Uh, but I'm very excited because I know that this is keep, keeps coming up. Okay. Councilman uh, Warren, and then followed by Councilwoman Robbins. Uh, Mr. Mullen, I just wanted to know, uh, is it standard operating procedure for us to put up traffic signals both for public and private and parochial schools? Um, so relative to traffic signals is what you're asking about. So for traffic signals, um, we we often get requests for new traffic signals. Um, we just can't randomly just install one, we actually have to go through a study. Um, that's uh, FHWA guidelines. We followed the Ashto Green Book for that uh, to determine whether or not it warrants a traffic signal or not. So and and do so that request. doesn't have any diff. It makes no difference whether it's a public school or a private school. Uh, it still is a traffic issue, and therefore we as a city provide traffic signals if appropriate. Is that correct? Um, so I'm speaking of just traffic signals alone, so that, that is correct. We often uh, require, say, developments and stuff like that to install traffic signals. I think what you're referring to here is um, uh, traffic control devices along um, 
public or private schools. Correct. Uh, in this case, the, the way historically we've um, uh, operated that program is the school will make the request to us for, say, a traffic or a, um, um, a school, yeah, school traffic uh, lights. And what we'll do is typically work with the school. Uh, the school would often um, fund the actual installation of that, and then the city takes <coughs> the maintenance operation of it in the future. So that's the way we partnered up with the school on that. Okay, I'll talk to you about some of the ones on this list in a few minutes. Thank you. Okay. Councilwoman Roberts. Thank you. I sent you a message about a uh, some traffic calming device or a light or something at the corner of Whitworth and Holmes Road. I get a call every day from the people who live at that corner. They see children who are about to get hit and they're out there trying to monitor that themselves and I told them that that was dangerous. I didn't need them out there trying to do that, but we need to study that intersection. We have a path where students can walk across the street, but you do know it's five lanes, it's wide, and the people are driving like uh, they're on an expressway. That's very dangerous for those middle school children, and middle school now starts at sixth grade, so they are very young, and that's too dangerous for them crossing Holmes Road, and that's Havenview School. So please investigate that because th that's important. Yes, ma'am. Thank you. Councilwoman Logan. Thank you, Chair. Uh, thank you for the presentation, uh, Director Boleyn. I had a principal reach out to me um, in one of my areas in my district for a request for a particular uh, traffic calming uh, method to be put in their area. Do I need to get that to you or talk to you about that? Or ca can that be added to this list? So what the list that we provided to you is uh, the engineering's initial uh, assessment of what uh, is important. So that the list there is in cooperation with the Memphis school uh, themselves. They, we reached out to them to identify um, schools that are in priority lists that they have, and we took those lists and worked it so that the funding that's available can be equally uh, distributed amongst um, the district. So with that said, this is our list. This is our engineering list. We always welcome the, uh, the way the budget and the the funding for this particular project was established is that the council members themselves were going to give us a list. However, um, in, in an effort to be proactive, we went ahead and created the list, provided those to you. So if there's any changes that each of the council members want to do, then we welcome that. Council, uh, okay, you. so Councilman Ford and Carlisle, but before we do, colleagues, I would just suggest though, this is, as we look at this, this is what's been proposed to us for this current fiscal year. On an ongoing basis, we look at something like this because to your point, Councilman Warren, all of these streets, whether they're private schools, public, parochial, these streets are city of Memphis streets. And so we're talking about the overall safety of all people, all children, throughout the city of Memphis. So I would hope that we accept this as it is, but this is just a smidget of the total schools that we have in the district, well, in the city of Memphis. And we have a, 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 a similar list to this next year. As I foresee it, I didn't count the how many, do you know offhand how many does this total? Is it, what is this, 30, whatever the case may be. If it's 30, we're talking about just 20% of the schools here. So I can see this as an ongoing priority for us We'll have a, a similar list next year and the year after that in order to address some of these things. And so uh, if we have these current allocations here, we, we may look to increase the budget next year so that we can accommodate more. But I think that this is the administration's effort because we need to, to present something to us. And then it's our obligation from a budgetary standpoint to bake it into the budget on, a, uh, on an ongoing basis. Councilman Ford and then Carlisle. Thanks, Chair. Uh, I'm going across the street now. How much did they give? Have they matched us? I had the same question. Uh, are, are, uh, can you repeat the question, Councilman? County side. Okay. Have they tried to match us? Uh, have they given any consideration of what we're doing, that they should be doing the same thing? Well, really, they should be doing more. 
because they're really over the schools. Okay, have they done anything? If not, I want to know where we can go across the street, okay? Yeah, no, no, Councilman, I'm unaware of, of Shelby County uh, doing similar uh, allocations and appropriations for funds just for this type of improvements, so I'm not aware of, of any of that. Okay, well, we will make sure that they are aware and they need to do their part. Thank you very much. Thank Council you, Carlisle. Thank you, Ms. Ford. Thank you, Chair. Uh, my question followed along Councilman Ford's as well, which is, you know, they they are city streets, but, you know, I guess since, since again, we're going to kill consolidation and we, you know, we're two thirds of the county, it sounds, seems like it would be reasonable to have some sort of, you know, some sort of matching. And I'd also say that in, in Council or Chairman Jones, you brought this up as well, which is we, you know, we'll look at schools because as a priority, we've got other intersections like East Parkway uh, in St. Cooper, which was that was just devastating to have to hear. Um, the school system should also help. Um, and so, uh, you know, we should reach out to our partners there. But I really like the idea of looking at some ongoing funding so that, because one of the things is we've got this list, and what I would suggest is, and I know we need to move on some of these things, but what I would suggest is that we get this out on, you know, our social media, our, our website, let people get a look at it for a few weeks. And, and you know, you don't want to turn it into like the Wild West, but at least see if we can get some feedback. Maybe somebody has an idea they want to put in for some public input, and then we can move forward on it. But going forward, if we know we're going to have some ongoing funding for it, it'll help us create a process much like the, the speed humps, I think would be helpful. So just, just some general thoughts. But thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Carlisle. Councilwoman Docker. Uh, Mr. Manning, I spoke with you, what, last week? And we talked about this. Um, and I guess one of the questions, So, I'm, I, and I have a total of eight in my district, um, and I was waiting to see the list out there. We talked about this, and one of the things that I have a question about is if, if we're focusing truly on the lights, the only thing I wanted to ask you about, which goes back to the question I asked you in your office, which was with the ADA, what are we going to do about the people, because we have a few students in, these, in, in my district whom are blind, so we have to make sure we meet their needs along with the flashing lights because they do walk to school. Their parents walk, walk them to school um, and also for the hearing impaired. So I'll come back to you with it. But the parents addressed that with me this week in their school meetings. So um, whatever you need for me to support this. And I do. Um, I did get the breakdown for the schools that may be possibly closing, which now makes sense to why this list looks like it looks. Thank you so much. Thank you. So, colleagues, uh, that takes us to item number eight. These things, seven and eight, were, uh, were similarly situated. So, at this time, there's a resolution before us to transfer and appropriate GO bond funding in the amount of 685000 for safety improvements. This is project number EN01112. All council districts uh, requested by the administration. So, this will take its normal course. Uh, we'll make a motion. We'll hear it. And on the meeting for October 11th. And so if there's any input that takes place between now and then, we can am amend this, uh, which talks about the funding for it. So may I have a motion on this item? Move, move by Ford, seconded by Carlisle. Uh, seeing no council members.
members present, Councilwoman Johnson, Councilman Smiley, Councilman Canale, Councilwoman Robinson, Councilwoman Dockery, Councilman Warren, Councilman Colvett, Councilman Ford, Councilman Carlisle, and Chair Logan. Present colleagues, today we have three items on the agenda. We are going to take items number two and three first. Um, so our first item is a quarterly update on drag racing from Memphis Police Department requested by Councilman Canale. And good morning, Chief. If you would just give us your name and address for the record and you recognize. Good morning, Madam Chair. Good morning, Council. Chief C.J. Davis, 170 North Main Street. This morning we have um, three main items and I think we'll be covering other um, items that may have been um, included on the agenda if we need to today. Um, we have uh, leadership in the department, subject matter experts who will speak in, on various uh, items. At this time I'm gonna bring up Deputy Chief Paul Wright who's going to give a presentation on drag racing. Thank you. Thank you. Deputy Chief Wright. Good morning. Give Deputy it. Chief Paul Wright over Uniform Patrol, uh, addressed with 170 North Main. Uh, we do have a presentation concerning our, our enforcement on drag racing and reckless driving. All right, so the enforcement of drag racing and reckless driving is currently even, if you see the numbers up there, uh, from last year's total. Uh, we had 80. We've had 80 um, uh, charges placed on the drag racing for 2022. That's compared to 2021's 80 as well. Uh, also in 2022, we've had 659 reckless driving, uh, 659 reckless driving charges brought against individuals uh, for the 2022. As of compared to 2021, uh, it's 18. Uh, in saying that, we look to exceed, or we look as if we're going to exceed the 650, uh, of course, the 810 number uh, for reckless driving this year. Uh, there's been a total of 441 uh, arrests made on individuals itself uh, in this 2022 period. We'll move on to the next slide. The next slide is a comparison it's a four-year comparison. Drag racing enforcement seems to have leveled off over the past four years associated with the 911 calls that we get and the vehicle disturbance calls that we've been taking in. We've actually seen a 15% decrease in our calls compared to last year. And we would like to contribute uh, those numbers uh, to uh, the enforcement that we put in and the work that we uh, uh, had our officers doing and operations that we put forth through the 2021 and 2022 season. Uh, we'd also like to thank our partners that's been coming in and helping out. Uh, of course, you, you must thank the THP as well as the uh, uh, Shelby County Sheriff and other agencies that's been working with us to uh, uh, bring about some of this change uh, that we've been seeing throughout the couple of years. Uh, when you look at the precincts uh, by numbers and the comparison by numbers, Austin P has made 46 total uh, charges on arrest. They look to uh, possibly exceed their number. Their highest number was 61. You go to Reigns, Reigns have made 55 charges this year uh, in the Reigns Station uh, precinct. You have made Mount Moriah, they've made 112 chargeable offenses for drag racing and reckless driving this year. Crump has made 86. Crump Station has made 86. Tillman Station has made 99. North Main Station has made 113. And North Main is gonna be uh, our highest station in the uh, charges being placed against individuals at the 113 that they placed. Uh, of course, that's our downtown area and individuals that come downtown, We we have ramped up our enforcement downtown and our officers personnel down there to deal with that. And so it's, it's, it's been successful uh, in our efforts. We have been successful in our efforts. So you go to Airways, you had 70, 70 actually uh, actual arrests made, charges made. And you look at Appling Farms, there was 64. 
uh, in Appling Farms, which is the Cordova area. Uh, compared to the year of uh, 2019, they had 121, if you look at their comparison. That was the highest they made, so 64 uh, is a, a big drop for them, and hopefully it shows that there's a, that's, that's a drop for the, the actual incidents occurring out there. And we also had Ridgeway at 94, and they're at their highest uh, in the past four years with their number of charges they placed against individuals. Uh, so with that said, uh, if there are any questions concerning drag racing and reckless drive. Thank you for your presentation. Um, Dr. Warren, you're recognized. Uh, Councilman Warren, you're recognized. Thank you. Uh, Deputy Chief. Standards, cars that were hit by speeding vehicles, things along that line. If we could have a report on the number of deaths, because I think that's one of the things citizens are seeing. Uh, you know, we're seeing people who are speeding, and then a, someone is is killed because of that. If you could look into that and maybe get that to us, I think we'd like to see if that's going down too. That's a major uh, criteria that I think the public would like to know. Thank you. Thank you. I'll see if that can be done. Okay. Councilman Carlisle. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, Several months ago, we brought in uh, DA Wyrick to, to see how this was translating from the Memphis Police Department to the courtroom. Um, I know our new DA is still getting into position, but I'd be um, very curious, and again, if, if his chief of staff or somebody wants to come over, the DA doesn't have to come himself. But again, for the general public, I don't want it to be lost that our police department is doing everything within their power, including coordinating with other agencies, myself, I'm sure others. I know I talked to a few of my colleagues. I think it was last two Thursdays ago, I, I drove down 240 in between airways and mill branch and saw three marked Tennessee highway patrols and one unmarked that had pulled someone over. Um, so it's certainly a help. And, and you can start to see the behavior shift. Uh, I know that I tapped my brakes. So, so, <laughs> so but in, in all sincerity, I'd really like to see, you know, when, when, when Chief Wright, I think it was you, I mean, we had like 600 something arrests and there was like four, four cases were prosecuted. Everything else was null pros. So, um, I'd really like to see what the, how that's tracking along. Uh, and it doesn't have to be immediate. I mean, I'm, I, again, I'm willing to kind of, but I'd like to see where the data trends are. Absolutely. Council member, I, I have met with DA Mulroy on a number of occasions in just the last couple of weeks. I actually will be meeting with him again today. And so we will ensure that on our next presentation, when we give you an update, we'll ensure someone from that office can really talk about what the future is as it relates to prosecuting these crimes. Thank you, Chief. And Chief, Thank and on you. that note, are in your conversations, I hope the DA is getting the funding that he needs from the county commission in order to make sure um, that we've got those um, uh, 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 district attorneys or, or, or um, people that work for the DA in the police station so that there's that coordination going on. I know that that's one of the initiatives that you really wanted yes. uh, in and, and want to make sure that we've got those those individuals in our police station so that we can we can process that. Absolutely. Uh, and then the other thing that uh, I know Councilman Alley is at least aware of is we've had discussions with state legislatures and um, we've discussed it last year, but I think I'll be, it, should it come forward, I'll be supporting, hoping with the sunset. But, but at this point, even though we are seeing some reduction, I'm not sure it's fast enough. And so um, I'll be I'll be supportive of legislation, and we'll talk about it later. Of looking at civil civil forfeiture of, of people that are drag racing and or reckless driving, I think unfortunately, and this is no this doesn't matter who's in the DA's office; it's not political. But the process that we have to go through during the justice system to to basically take someone's sixty, seventy, eighty thousand dollar automobile uh, is not working. We we arrest it, we impound it, they get it back until they're convicted. And the reality is is that the litmus test beyond reasonable doubt and what the officer is able to witness and has on video, any reasonable person could come to the conclusion that this individual uh, is not responsible enough to have that automobile going 150 to 180 miles an hour down 40. And I think at some point, the only thing that we're going to be able to do is make such a disruption in the marketplace 
that it's untenable to drag race or, or drive at, at a high rate of speed. So I hope um, as that legislation comes forward that you'll, you, you and your team will, will do your due diligence. And certainly, I, you know, I, I'd ask that should the language be um, something that you're willing to live with it, that in concept you'd support something like that. Absolutely. We'll, we'll be glad to work with you on whatever legislation that you plan to support. Thank you, Chief. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Chair. Colleagues, anyone else? Uh, Councilman Canale. Thank you, Madam Chair. Chief, how many T dedicated THP do we have on the interstate system right now? Actually, we've increased to about 12 in this area, and we have seen a very noticeable, consistent presence. And I've been communicating with Tennessee Highway Patrol, our appreciation, some of the discussions that we've had, you know, over the last 12 months or more um, have been that we need to see that presence here. It makes a difference in our crime fighting and it certainly makes a difference in our deployment of our officers to be able to handle other types of um, emergencies and public safety issues. Okay, and with hopes of getting that number to 20? 20. Okay. 20 um, was, was what the um, Tennessee Highway Patrol and um, the state committed to. Okay. So yeah. we're paying attention. Absolutely, and I would agree. I, like Councilman Carl, I have seen uh, an increased presence, and uh, I think it's definitely making a difference. And to all the uh, reckless drivers and drag racers out there, uh, please know that the THP will and can pursue you. <laughs> Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you. Uh, Councilman Warren. Uh, at, at the end of the, not this, at the end of the, at the end of the committee. committee. Okay, I'm at this time. Thank you for that presentation. And um, the next item on the agenda is an update from the police department on new police shifts, car inventory, sexual assault kit processing, and the deployment of manpower. All council districts requested by Councilman Carlisle. Uh, we're going to open up with statements from, yeah. from uh, Councilman Canale. Carlisle. Carlisle. That's okay. Can, it's, it's actually Can Carlisle. Carlisle. Uh, I'll be really quick. It's really not a. It's not a big statement. I just want to explain explain to my colleagues how it, it literally looks like my committee. It's like parks, neighborhoods, like everything under the sun. But I was texting with uh, with Brianna last weekend, and I was like, these are the things that I'd like to talk about. But the overarching theme here is 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 kind of three. One, obviously, the rape kits have come into focus again, and we need to stay on that. Two, and if you guys remember, we sat down, I think we were still meeting somewhat virtually, but we talked about the Deloitte efficiency study a couple years ago, much like a Baker Tilly for MLGW. And this is just kind of a check-in on how that's proceeding as we start to talk about best ways to deploy manpower. Are we being efficient? You know, are they on target to hit the goals that, that the police department wants to meet, whether it's paperwork and electronic systems, all that stuff. And then lastly, Chief Davis has started some initiatives um, since she's gotten here and kind of getting feedback on how that's going. And then lastly, I've been, you know, as we know, we, we've, we've initiated the money for take home car program. But in addition to that, we've just, uh, in prior years before this council, there were some gaps in when we were buying and ordering police cars. We've got cruisers out there that, you know, have 150, 160, 130,000 miles on them. And so, you know, kind of how that's going, especially with this new, the, the removal of the Delta shift and what, if anything, this body should or needs to do as it relates to maybe accelerating some of those capital purchases. So that, just for my colleagues, that's kind of where I was driving this. I know it sounds like a kid with ADHD right here, which <laughs> would be me. So, so I just wanted you guys to kind of have the, the theme of, of the request today. Thank you, Chair. You're welcome. Chief Davis, do you have a floor? Um, thank you. I will let the team begin presenting on each one of those topics. Thank you. Again, thank you, Deputy Chief Paul Wright, 170 North Main again. Uh, I'm going to update on the uh, the workload, our uh, uh, shift, uh, and how we deploy our staffing for our workloads. The 911 call center, uh, communication center, provided us information on uh, the number of calls that we receive throughout the 2022 season. Uh, we deploy our staffing off of workloads. Uh, that we that we have come in throughout uh, calls itself through 911 emergency. Um, Memphis Police Department deployment is based on the workload. 
uh, resources are aligned with the workload demand. The MPD has three shifts, an alpha shift, which is 11 to 7 a.m., 11 p.m. to 7 a.m., the Bravo shift, which is a 7 a.m. to 3 o'clock p.m., and a Charlie shift, which is a 3 o'clock p.m. to 11 a.m. shift. Uh, there are traditionally three different shift times operating on a nationwide level. Uh, and the best practice, we, we, we adopted that practice of these three shifts. Uh, if you look at our surrounding cities, they're operating, the county's operating under three shifts. Uh, you look at Bartlett, Germantown, Collierville, they're operating under the three shift basin. They are eight hour shifts. Uh, the eight hour shifts is premier. Uh, these shifts uh, best serve the citizens that we, we serve here in the city of Memphis. And going into the presentation, the 911 call center receives approximately 55,000 calls for service each month in over a 24-hour period. The busiest time is from 3 o'clock p.m. to 11 o'clock p.m. And if you look at the chart that we have, uh, you can see the three shifts. They're pictured in there with the times itself. Uh, around the 2,300 hours, you notice that there's a uh, around 1,900 calls, 19,000 calls actually, and that's that's on a year basis now. Uh, this is an hourly chart. Uh, when you're looking at that, you see that that's our midnight shift from 2,300 to 0, 0,700 hours or 7 o'clock a.m. hour. That's our midnight shift. And if you see, that's our lowest call. We get our lowest calls during the midnight shift. Of course, you see the peak around 2300, which is 11 o'clock p.m. And around 12 o'clock a.m. in the morning, you see where you get a little peak right in there. But after that, you start seeing our call loads go down uh, between that alpha shift hour of 11 o'clock p.m. and 7 o'clock a.m. Now at the 7 o'clock a.m. mark, if you pick up uh, right along that chart there, you'll see that the calls start picking back up. And that's because individuals are waking up and they're seeing things that they didn't see from the night before or things have happened or occurred. So people are waking up and calling police and they're needing the services. Uh, as they wake up, of course, the calls increase throughout the day. And as you go from 7 o'clock a.m. to around the 1,400 hours, you'll notice that the calls tend to start really picking up drastically. And of course, that's from a various amount of things that's going on at that point. And as the calls pick up at around 1,500, that's when our next shift is coming on. Okay, so between the day shift hours, it's the second less calls that we're getting, least calls that we're getting during that day shift hours. It's the second least. As we move into our third shift, which is the 1,500 or 3 o'clock p.m. shift, you'll see that the calls are really amping up at that time, and that's where you want your, your workload or your, your manpower to position that. You want them there before it starts hitting the ample times of 1,600 hours, or that's 4 o'clock p.m. I'm sorry for speaking in military, but you want them there before the calls start hitting the 4 o'clock p.m and the five o'clock p.m. hours. You want them out before that, and you want the largest amount of your force out before that hour because you wanna try to cut that in half, if you can, by putting your forces out during these hours prior to those five o'clock hours. So as you, as you put your forces out, you notice that the time start decreasing as you go on in your shift. As you go on in the shift up to the 11 o'clock p.m. hours, your shift calls drop. And of course, that's because people are going to bed and whatever other things they're doing, but they're, they're, they're winding down that day. Uh, but between the hours of three or two and 11, you got a large amount of calls going on between that time. And then if you compress that even more between the times of two and five, you're getting your peak at calls, and that's where you want your workload to be focused at because you want the best service for the people of Memphis. You want fast service, and you want people to be able to get there. So that's what, uh, 
That's what your shift loads show in data. That's what the data show from our, uh, our MPD communications division. So can I ask a quick question though? So on that point, I understand the volume of calls and I know you prioritize the type of calls, right? Yeah. My question for what you would be, and I would just make an assumption, and it is a huge assumption because I don't know. But I'm a, I would assume that the majority of the calls, even though the volume is going up, my guess is that correlating with that would be the, the volume of lower priority calls during the day, right? So what I'd be curious to know is, is, is the priority, even though you're getting fewer calls, if those are what we, we would consider higher priority, more violent, more problematic, maybe longer calls, there is a correlation yeah. there, and that's exactly it. Your violent crimes are taking place during these hours. So, so to the point, though, then why wouldn't I have as much manpower at nighttime necessarily or more because those are the, those are the crimes that we are really struggling to deal with versus the lower priority calls or things that we can figure out how to have other responses to. And again, at the end of the day, like I wish we both wish that we could wave a wand and have 500 more bodies, but but we don't. So. Yeah. Again, and I'm not trying to catch off guard. Those are, these are just some of the things that, that I think we're all thinking about and that the public would, would want to know, too, because we're not experts in, in law enforcement. Just a second. All right. I got it. Right. Please state your name and address yeah. for the record, sir. Sean Jones, 170 North Main. So I'm over the 911 center. So you want to be able to, to respond to the workload. When a person dial 911, we don't want them to wait an inordinate amount of time for someone to arrive to the scene. So these this volume of calls is based on the 911 responses. Yes, there are a mixture of calls that are in there as it relates to violent calls as well on all shifts across all areas. But what we try to do is monitor that, and we put our crime suppression and our specialized units out to be able to address some of those concerns that are occurring during that time. But the main focus has to be that 911 response. Don't want a person waiting 45 minutes. Don't want them waiting an hour. We need to be able to meet the demand of service, and that's how we respond to those 911 calls. That's a very fair response. Mm -hmm. So we can continue to move on. Um, there's a third slide, I think, in the alpha shield. I don't agree with it. I think we touched on that, of course. I'll open up if there are any questions. Were you, were you done? Okay. All right. We're going to have any uh, colleagues in the queue. You might want to be recognized. All right. If there are no other comments, um, Councilman Carlisle, did you get uh, all of your? Well, I think for that was to deal with the shift. I think we still have some other pieces of this thing. Stuff, yes. Yeah. Curfew. We can do curfew next. Well, I think if we could, let's hold curfew for Councilwoman Logan's right, okay. resolution. But if we could talk about vehicles okay, and the rape good. kits, and then I think if any remarks from Chief Davis, generally if she does, um, and then we then curfew for that's going to be yes, last. Yes, We're going to go ahead and take all of the items, uh, the information that's in item number two at this time. And if you're done with that presentation, that's what I'm asking. Yeah. No, item number not. two. It's, we have we have a couple of other areas Perfect. that you can go right cover. ahead, Chief. Okay. Absolutely. So it's vehicles. Ve vehicles. vehicles so go ahead I got the that. vehicle presentation. Yeah. yeah. So I have vehicles. Uh, so currently we have uh, 1,531 vehicles in our local fleet. Uh, of that, 676 of those vehicles are assigned to our uniform patrol. The remainder of those vehicles are assigned to individual units uh, within the organization to support their basic functions from a day to day. Um, from, from day to day. Um, uh, 549 of those cars are marked patrol cars and 127 of those are lieutenant patrol cars that are out there in the field overseeing the activities of the officers who are responding to the calls uh, each and every day. As it relates to, uh, you know, we talked about take home cars. So as it relates to take home cars, we, those, we have 30 take home cars that are fully equipped now and they will be d distributed to our officers in within the next two weeks. Um, uh, the field operations division, they've been working. We had like 130 people who put in for those cars. Right now we're trying to vet them to see which 30 would get the cars first. So as soon as we vet them, uh, we've established a policy that kind of governs 
uh, who would get the car, how do you keep the car? And, and so we'll be utilizing, utilizing that to be able to award those cars to the personnel. The idea is to make sure that we have cars in each council district, try to touch as many wards as we possibly can, and as more cars roll out, we'll put those cars in play. Uh, quite naturally, we have uh, about 140 cars that are on the ground in Nashville. Those are the ones, well, actually 70 are on the ground in Nashville of those 140, let me say it that way. Um, they're being equipped currently. Uh, 10 of them have been fully equipped as we speak, and they will be shipped to us. Once they come to us, we'll make sure that they, we finish the equipping those cars with uh, the radios and the the cameras for the cars and stuff, then those cars will be ready to be put in, put out as well. Uh, so um, I don't have a timeline from the vendor on those on those cars coming to us, but as soon as we get those cars, and as soon as we can put the equipment in from our standpoint, we'll put those cars out in the field too. But um, in the next two weeks, we will have the cars and they will be put out um, for our patrol officers in the various locations. So. And I think that's it. So roughly, and I know that when we say, I'm glad you put vehicles in here because I know that encompasses pretty much everything, right? Like right. We, we say police car, people think cruiser and, right. and it's more than right. that. So everything's not. Roughly a third, and this may be more of a, a better question for Antonio Adams and I can get it from him offline because my follow-ups will be, you know, what is our policy on cruisers in particular? And I think we, we asked him, but it's two years ago, but what's the age of the vehicle and, and what's the mileage until right. we determine that that it's, it's, you know, we're going to strip it down and then, and then yeah. auction it off. Yeah. So I can and, answer that. Okay. So uh, he and I, we have a conversation about vehicles frequently. Um, you know, we have vehicles and I've had opportunities to talk with uh, the administration as well. And so we're working on a plan to be able to try to move new vehicles into the fleet. But the, currently we have vehicles that may be uh, 2010, and up to 2021, 2022. I think I saw a Ford Taurus rolling around the other right, day. Right. I mean, so, like, right, right. do y'all remember I'm those? Saying, yeah. <laughs> right. So our goal is to, to move those right. vehicles out. The typical life expectancy of a vehicle uh, is either three years or 100,000 miles. Okay. We have some occasions where they, we may have gone over that. But nonetheless, uh, you know, that's the, pretty much the lifespan of a vehicle. Okay. And, that, and that, look, that's helpful. And my, my follow-up question would be, what percentage of our cars have, have met or exceeded that? Do you, so, do you, yeah. I can answer that, too. Yeah. <laughs> so pretty much uh, more about 80% of our fleet may fall into that so this is category. But again, I've met with the administration, the chief and I, and our team, and Antonio Adams, and we, we're working on a plan to be able to uh, revitalize that fleet. Yeah, and, and I appreciate that. And I look forward to hearing that plan, certainly if we're coming up to the next budget season. Mm -hmm. This is and I mean this, no disrespect to the administration at all, but we are the appropriating body. Right. Like we need to help, we need help in partnership with the administration to set these plans and processes. Okay. But this is one of those things where, you know, on a day in, day out touch point, we're the ones getting the multitude of phone calls and emails. Right. And so, right. you know, when we're, when we're getting that kind of feedback and I'll use the term pressure because people like right. that term too, uh, you know, there's a high motivation to make sure that whether it's manpower or, or human capital or actual physical capital that our police department has what it needs to do the job. And not only that, but from a morale standpoint, right. I can only imagine what it's like to be, you know, at that point in your career where you're three, four, five years in, and, you know, it's like, it's like free agency. People are starting to come a call and they got a brand right. new, you know, right. brand new truck out there for you. Right. So, you know, we want to make sure that we're doing everything directly and indirectly to support right. our police department from a tacti tactical standpoint and a morale standpoint. Yes, sir. Um, so I, I appreciate that information. It's very helpful. And I'll, we'll keep these notes um, as we head into budget season. I really do look forward to a plan. Um, you know, I, I want to say we can do all of it, but until you, you bring me a number, I don't know. I know that Chairman Jones is going to tell me that there's a very simple way to pay for that. <laughs> but, but I look forward to that. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. Um, you're welcome. Thank you. Uh, Councilman Smiley. Thank you for the presentation. Um, how do we determine which officers uh, receive the take-home vehicles and which district um, the vehicles will go? Well, absolutely. So uh, Chief Wright, is, we've developed a policy working with Chief Wright. In that policy, we were looking at things from people who have been involved in, uh, they may have had sustained complaints, uh, the number of years of service. We look at their performance on the job as well. And it's probably about five or six different you know, factors that we look so at. So it's merit-based? Pretty much say merit based, you know, for the most part, based on people, what they do, and what those variables are within the policy. Okay. Yeah, but we do have a policy that governs that. Okay, and then how do we determine? I think we talked about this a while back, but I, 
I need a little clarity now. Um, how do we determine which district the, the vehicles will end up in? Well, the intent is to put vehicles in every single district. We want to try to go as evenly distributed as we possibly can based on where people live within the city. Quite naturally, one of the requirements is residents in the city to be able to put them in that district. So, so as evenly distributed as we possibly can to make sure that we cover all the districts. And I so, will add to that, because I know where you're going. <laughs> but go ahead. We, we, have, we have discussed intensively also to make sure that there is a present throughout, presence throughout the city, but we're using data also to help drive those decisions. Uh, we want to ensure that not only is this an incentive for our employees, but we also want to be able to use these vehicles to be a visible deterrent in communities that we um, see various types of, of crimes too. I think we're on the same page. So where I was going, I think you, you kind of uh, you gathered that. I was trying to see if we were at all contemplating or considering the fact, well, there is a significant amount of crime occurring in these particular zip codes. So maybe instead of putting two over here and two over there, maybe this, this community should probably have three and that community should probably have one. You are absolutely on point. And we are utilizing right. zip codes as right. well where our officers uh, live. Right. But um, as we roll out these first 30, we wanted to, um, make sure that our officers knew that everybody is going to have an opportunity but as we get more vehicles we want to make sure that those vehicles are placed with officers that live in the communities that that need them the most and and the data suggests that um having at home vehicles in the community will have a, a impact on crime in a good way absolutely um you know a visible deterrent to have vehicles or those vehicles just moving in and out of those communities is a, is, a, is a deterrent in itself. So we're looking forward to it. My previous work, we had a take-home vehicle program. It was very effective. The community loved the fact that those vehicles were moving, you know, outside of calls for service, moving inside of communities that sometimes may have some issues, but just that visibility helped deter it. Okay, and then my next question is, do we have any type of mechanism to track, okay, well, we assigned 10 vehicles into this particular community and we believe that it had this type of deterrent effect. Is there any type of way for us to track that and measure that? Because, you know, if it's successful and we are able to deter crime based on uh, visible deterrents, maybe we should consider how figuring out how we can fund more take on vehicles. Absolutely. So those zip codes, we can easily start a baseline for, you know, when we roll out this, this program. Of course, there'll be other factors okay. that will come into play. But I think it would be very interesting data a year from now to see whether or not where those vehicles were placed, we saw some reductions in crime too. So I, I don't know if... I received a definitive answer, so I'm assuming we are going to track it. Yes. Okay. We, we, we not only plan to track that, we plan to track the use of the vehicles as well. You know, making sure that our officers aren't just driving to and from home. We plan to have some uh, other uh, added responsibilities that they attend X amount of, you know, community meetings so that those vehicles be can be used in other ways to benefit the city as well. Okay. Thank you. Good deal. Thank you. Thank you. Anyone else? Uh, Councilman Warren. Thank you. Thank you, Chief. Um, one other thing I've been hearing a lot from constituents is about, um, I guess, the, the theft of catalytic converters. And I'm wondering, do we have any sort of organized counteraction to try to see if we can catch the people who are doing this and stop this from being so pervasive? Well, we have units in our organized crime unit area that have been focusing on the whole catalytic converter um, thefts. We're looking at pawn shops as well. Mm -hmm. these, these catalytic converters are being sold, but this may be another conversation that we have with our legal department to really look at what are the parameters, you know, that individuals have to be able to pawn precious metals and how is it monitored and so on. Um, a lot of that is part of this whole making money off of someone's catalytic converter. Sometimes we realize that those pawn shops not, might not be here in the city of Memphis. They may be other places where some of these precious metals are being sold to. We have um, uh, 
um, executed warrants on chop shops and had found catalytic converters and other precious metals, you know, from stolen vehicles in the city. As a matter of fact, over the last three weeks, um, our auto theft task force has has done some considerable work on identifying some of these chop shops okay. where some of these precious metals from vehicles have been found as well. Is there some sort of legislative uh, items that we can bring forward that may be helpful to you if there are, bring them to us, any sort of ordinances or laws that we possibly can pass that can give you uh, additional assistance? Yeah, there could be. Um, I'd like to have a conversation with my team to really talk about what that looks like. Uh, if there are some gaps that we can close through legislative changes, um, that might be a possibility. Uh, and um, our, our legal advisor is here, so we'll, we'll come back to you on that. Something like just if you uh, pawn a precious metal, that has to be reported, and the amount of ha has to be reported, and who does it, so we can see if we see patterns or something that will give you a hand. I don't know, but bring that back to us. Thank you, Absolutely. Madam Chair. Councilwoman Johnson. Thank you, Chair. My question is, how you doing, by the way? I'm good. How okay, are you? It's fine. Good, thank you. These take-home cars, do they have any limitations on what, how they can be utilized? I know you take them home, go to work, but can I go to the local uh, grocery store with them? Can I go out of state with them? What will, what will we actually see these cars we be, have being a very used? strict policy okay. as it relates to the use of these vehicles. And um, just to give you an idea, that vehicle can be utilized going to and from work. Officers will be able to make stops if they need to on the way home. You might see an officer at a grocery store if he's en route you know, to his home. There are restrictions as far as passengers are concerned in these vehicles. So we have a very robust policy. Um, we also plan to ensure that we uh, keep up with the maintenance on the vehicles. Uh, it's been proven in take-home vehicle uh, programs. The maintenance typically goes down considerably on vehicles because the officers have more of an ownership about the vehicle and they take care of them better. Let me ask you this question. What about the passengers? Are that family members? Can they take a child to school in the morning? What can actually, how can a car I be utilized? I would highly recommend not. Okay. Because that vehicle is a uniform vehicle and that officer could get caught up in any type of situation at any time the public recognizes them as a uniform patrol officer so uh, placing family members in danger in those kind of situations um, I, I have and, and I'm pretty sure that policy yes, will it, dictate it that there are it, no it does very it good does. Um, Deputy Chief Wright, smart man. He did okay. exactly what I wanted him to do on that. So. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so they definitely cannot use them to go out the city. Um, the vehicles can be used. Well, the patrol vehicles. Follow the policy. What's right. that? Just following the policy. We, you know, the existing city policy, get permission through the right. supervisor of the chain of command to take a vehicle out of the city for business. But business purposes. purposes, right. Okay. Mm -hmm. Right. Okay. And those will be rare occasions. Oh. oh. Got a question. Now that we people can drive, um, how many miles y'all say y'all want them to drive home to be okay? It's longer than 25. Was it 50 miles? What was it that we they agreed to? The state said you couldn't limit it them. It to they have to so, live in the city, though, for the take-home uh, vehicles. They have to live in the city for the okay. take-home vehicles. Yeah. So it would be limited to, to individual living in the city. Okay, that's yes. good. Okay, thank you, thank you. Thank you, colleagues. At this time, we're going to have your uh, final presentation on, I think you have one on the sexual assault kit sexual assault task kits. force. Yes. Up Go there. right ahead. Major Minga, who oversees the um, sex crimes unit, will be conducting that presentation. All right, Casey Minga, address is 170 North Main. Regarding the uh, sexual assault kit processing, Tennessee, Tennessee state law states that uh, all kits are, are to be taken to TBI within 30 days. Uh, our policy states that we will take them to TBI within 96 hours of being tagged in property and evidence. 
regarding the backlog of rape kits prior to 2013. There were 12,762 kits. All of those kits have been sent off for testing and returned. Um, out of those that, that came back negative, there's, next slide please. Just, I'll, I'll read this to you just so I don't confuse anybody. DNA technology has advanced in recent years and evidence that screen negative for serology under traditional methods in the past deserves re-examination for DNA using the least, the, these latest techniques. So um, we sent 2,625 kits that tested negative. We sent them back to Bodie for retesting. 2,524 of those have been complete. 440 came back with a, a positive for male DNA. We sent 132 of those back to TBI for potential CODIS upload. We've received five matches. Currently, out of those 12,762 cases, 9,216 of those investigations have been initiated. Right now, we have 567 that are active, which means we have closed 8,649 of those 12,762 cases. Out of those, 735 requests for indictments have been completed. Next slide, please. Next slide. Uh, data entry, um, we have a database. Uh, part of the grant requires research. U of M does that research. So we, uh, we enter those cases into this database. So far, we have uh, entered uh, 6,537 of those. Um, for the research purposes with the U of M. That's it. Next slide. And for the month of August, we did not have any prosecutions from the um, from those twelve thousand cases. Be reminded that there is pending litigation, so be mindful of your questions. We're going to go to Councilman Carlisle. Madam Chair, I'll be quick because I know we need to move on, and this can come back in other items today. What is the statute of limitations for sexual assault or rape crimes in the state of Tennessee? As, a, all right, as far as those Saki cases, they range from 1976 to 2013. Okay. Okay. Over those years, that statute of limitation has changed. So depending on when the crime occurred depends on what the statute of limitations is for that case. Okay. So they have That's changed. fair. I, get, I got it. It's, it's, a, it's not a, I hear you. So I, I need to go back and I'll pull that up for myself because I am I am curious. And then you mentioned the CODIS database. What, just for the general public, what's the litmus test? I mean, we, this sounds so stupid. We've all seen CSI. So, right. So we've heard the term, but, but can you talk a little bit about the CODIS database, the litmus test for how people's DNA is entered into that? And then. Okay. I'm not an expert in, in the CODIS database for DNA. Okay. Um, TBI does the entering. We don't do that. Okay. We may have to get Baker down here and somebody, because again, it's, it's a curious thing to me because my follow-up question that is, is what other databases is TBI utilizing, right? So you've, we've, you've seen some, some stories and, and reports coming from other states where they've utilized other, um, even private sector um, DNA databases to identify suspects. And, and whether or not our, our partners, either at the state or federal level, are accessing those to identify uh, several of these potential John Doe's that are not in the CODIS database, which I think is typically a criminal database. You, you basically have been in touch with the criminal justice system if you're in CODIS one way or the other, right? There's recently a case, I think, out in California where they identified a, 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 a criminal who is in a shoplifting case because they had actually been a victim in a prior sexual assault case, and now it's it's starting to, to turn some questions. But for me, I, you know, I know there's going to be a, 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 and it's around privacy, but my point to you is, is we have a significant amount and great work on closing the significant amount of cases. But, you know, 414 John Doe's, I, I can't remember if that's the exact number here. Let's see. Yeah, 421 John Doe's is a significant amount. And our, you know, what is, what tools are available to the state, federal government, and our local agencies to, that we may not be using today? Right. There, there are other um, programs that use some of the public 
um, companies that do DNA, genealogy. There are programs, we submitted cases for that, but again, not, I don't want to get into those cases. Yeah, fair, fair enough. And, I'll, and what, I'll, what I think I'll do is, I know we need to wrap up for today on this, but at some point, I guess, what we need to do is, is either have a private attorney-client conversation or potentially have a conversation just with our partners at the state level to get a little bit more of, from their perspective, because I definitely don't want to pin you down and, and put you in a, in a weird spot. But nor, and, and look, this is, and we got to move on, but this is going to start to come up. People, we're going to have to have this conversation balancing privacy rights and just gen general, general, you know, justice. And I know that that's, that's been going on since the beginning of time in this country, but, but it's starting to become much more of a serious issue. Um, and, and people rightfully so are looking for justice in that, in that regard. Um, so anyway, I, I'll move on, but thank you for your, for the report. Thank you, chair. Anyone else we recognize on this item? All right, thank you for the presentation. Our last item is a resolution. I am introducing a substitute resolution and will read um, the caption of the final, therefore be resolved clause into the record. Resolution requesting the Memphis Police Department to enforce the curfews of the Child Curfew Act of 1995 and work with the City of Memphis administration on a proposal to open one or more curfew centers in the City of Memphis. Whereas comprehensive community-based juvenile curfew programs can help reduce juvenile crime and delinquency the victimization of minors and save young lives by reducing chances of violent incidents and or incidental injury. And whereas in 1996, the city of Memphis adopted ordinance number 4430, establishing curfews for individuals under the age of 18 and the age of 17 respectfully, as authorized by Tennessee code and, and 39, dash 17 dash 1701 also known as the child curfew act of 19 1995 and whereas tennessee code um, and 39 dash 17 dash 1701 was amended in 2015 by adding the following subsection regarding minors in violation Number two, take the minor into custody and transport the minor to a designated curfew center and now therefore be resolved in response to public safety concerns and the critical need for increased youth intervention, the Memphis City Council requests the Memphis Police Department to strongly enforce minor curfews as established in the Child Curfew Act of 1995. Be it further resolved, the Memphis City Council requests the Memphis Police Department to work with the City of Memphis administration on a proposal to open one or more overnight curfew centers in the City of Memphis and to present the proposal during the October 11th Public Safety Committee of the Memphis City Council. And I so move, moved by myself and seconded by Councilman Smiley. Are there any members in the queue? However, before I go to my colleagues, I do want to say, colleagues, crime is top of mind for all Memphians. And juvenile crime has spiked over the years. Um, there is no magic wand. This is not the cure-all. But the things that we already have on the books, we definitely, definitely want to enforce. Um, you know, it's going to take everyone at every level doing all that we can. I commend our um, men and women in blue for all the th that you all are doing, Chief Davis. However, we the things that are on the books, we definitely want to make those things happen. Um, I've, you know, talked to... Um, constituents, um, all different people in the community, and everyone is very concerned. The things that we've seen in, in among our juveniles has just really alarmed all Memphians. And one thing that we do know, if they're in the house, a lot of this wouldn't be happening. If they were at home uh, under parental um, uh, supervision, some of these things wouldn't, wouldn't be happening. These violent crimes that we've talked about today, uh, delinquency, um, a lot of things that are going on overnight in, at night after curfew time, uh, it's, it's imperative that we get a handle on that. And that's just one, one approach 
to us getting a handle on, on crime in our city. And as I said, this is top of mind. So, you know, there are many ways that we can approach it, many things that come into play when we look at this, and I understand that. Um, and that's why I'm asking for uh, the Memphis Police Department and administration to get together and come back with a proposal. You, you know, whatever need, research needs to be done, let that happen, and then you all come back and let us know how we can approach it. Um, this curfew centers are in other cities successfully, and uh, this is something that we can look at. We already have on the books that they will be taken to juvenile court. This is an option for those that may not need to go to juvenile court. Or, or other um, things that need to be considered. Um, but we would, I would like to see um, you all come back with a proposal. And now I will um, open up for questions and comments from colleagues. Councilman Smiley. Thank you. Um, so generally, I think, I think most, of, most of this council is uh, of the mindset that this generally is a good idea um, I, I have a couple of questions, though, that I don't really know the answer to, and I'm assuming someone here does. <laughs> Chief McGowan, I would love to see you somewhere. Um, I guess the first question um, is, do we have a number of the approximate youth that we, um, I guess, have some type of contact with after what, what the uh, curfew hours are? And I have um, no idea what they are. In anticipation for this, um in anticipation for this conversation, we put together just a couple of slides for to help inform. A presentation. Like, excuse me? A presentation. Yes, presentation. Okay. It's not going to be long. It's just to help inform. We do well, have the answers sure. to that. Um, and actually, I'm going to let uh, Deputy Chief Hines run through these. This will tell you what the current state has been as it relates to some of the issues that, that you've brought up. And I'm very glad that we're having this conversation. Came about from the last meeting as well. From from the last meeting, council, this committee. Well, you can go ahead. I'll see. Well, and it, it may be in there, Madam President. I'm sorry, uh, but we'll we'll make sure that we answer whatever questions that you do have. Thank you. Mm -hmm. All right. Good morning, good morning. <coughs> Deputy Chief Sam Hines, uh, 170 North Main Street. Memphis, Tennessee, 38103. Uh, so, uh, Council, Councilman Logan, um, you hit dead on it because well, I was going to open up with uh, the need for the resources to properly, uh, aggressive, properly and aggressively enforce the uh, curfew violations. But first on this slide, uh, obviously we, we operate uh, with the statute 3917702, which addresses the curfew uh, violations, along with our city ordinance, which mirrors uh, that TCA code uh, using section 10-28-4. Um, also, we use the support of uh, uh, DCS when we can to do referrals uh, or take the referrals from the state. Also, we use been utilizing uh, as a very soft approach uh, with the opening of the Youth and Family Resource Center, uh, which handles referrals on behalf of uh, any juveniles in uh, in Shelby County. Uh, so, with that, that has uh, when we come across the juveniles that don't have serious offenses, this may be their first curfew violation. We would definitely refer them out to the Youth. Uh, resource center uh, for help and with the family as yeah, well. Yeah. Over on the left on this same chart, it just kind of shows you what we have done over the last four years. Uh, if we look at 2019, uh, where we had, you know, 186 summons that was written and we had 46 transports where we had people in custody, the juveniles in custody where we took them home, may have taken them to juvenile court, uh, may have given them to some other guardian. And if we go back to the left, you'll see what we're operating with in 2022. Obviously, there was a dip in 2020 and 2021 uh, during the COVID uh, time frame uh, where we were not you know, taking kids to facilities, juvenile court, uh, just the, the system overall. But you can see here in 2022, 
In custody, we have, we've had in our custody and transported juveniles, uh, 52 different juveniles, either back home to juvenile court, uh, to some other place uh, for safekeeping at that time if they was in violation of the curfew and 130 uh, summons. So the things that you kind of hit on, that you hit on very well with the resolution, which comes very timely, uh, basically we're saying we do not have all the resources um, in the police department in order to properly enforce the curfew, curfew violations as needed. I think with the resolution, if that's approved, then I think that would help us greatly. One of the big things is when we pick up the juveniles, where do we take them if the parent is not home? Also, we do tie quite a bit of uh, manpower when we are transporting them back home, but that is a need to get them off the street. So I think we can, we can do that, but if the parent is not home, if a guardian is not home, uh, what do we do with the child? Going to juvenile court, juvenile court typically do not like to take uh, juveniles just on the curfew violation itself. If there are other charges, then they, they will take them. Uh, probably in some uh, you know, except, exceptional uh, circumstances, they would, but typically they don't. They don't like for that to be the clearinghouse for the juveniles and just uh, end up taking them there. So having that centralized location to drop the kids off at a center is, is really, really important. So at the end of the day, after all other means are exhausted, the officers would know where they can take and, uh, and leave the juvenile. So with that, with the change in policy, with the resolution, uh, that would help uh, greatly on the accommodation piece because I don't think juvenile court would be able to take on 20 or 25 kids and on any given, Friday, Saturday, Sunday night, around Bill Street and other venues, we could easily find 20 to 25 juveniles that are in violation uh, of the curfew. Um, so then the officer end up being the custodial officer, again, tied up with a juvenile, and what do we do with them? Uh, currently, uh, we have, a, again, the Family Resource Center, uh, but it's not open after hours. Right. Okay. And uh, I think that's in your district. So we're, we're familiar with that and very proud of it. And we're making progress with some of those other uh, soft violations. Uh, so uh, that kind of concludes the, the presentation that we have on the, on the uh, curfew at this point in time. We will come back with those answers and a plan uh, given that we have a central location to drop them off. Uh, the things that I give you here is not necessarily uh, excuses, but the things that need to be highlighted in order for us to be able to strongly uh, enforce the juvenile, I mean, the uh, curfew ordinance. Absolutely, and thank you for that. I do, I'm very familiar with the Youth and Family Resource Centers in my district and know what they do, and I do also understand that they, they don't stay open overnight, so there's really nowhere, so that's the reason for um, the... Um, the resolution and you know as I said earlier there are a number of things at play when we discuss us enforcing the law that's already on the book so um, having this opportunity for you all to go back with the administration to come up with the plan to look at what other cities are doing to look at um, you know the private sector nonprofit sector being a being a partner in this that would give that opportunity and you all can come back to us. We, you know, we're all here working together to resolve this. So um, we want to make sure that we're set up for success so that we can um, make sure our youth are set up for success. Not all youth that are out are doing criminal acts. Um, and so this is an, a, a way to accommodate for them in addition to um, what's on the books that, to take them to juvenile court. So that's already there, but this offers another option that you all can explore. And so we just look forward to you all coming back on the 11th um, with that and, and, and let, us, let us know. We have some others in the queue. I've never finished. Huh? I've never finished. Okay, I'm sorry. <laughs> Go ahead. Okay. Go ahead, Councilman Smiley. All right, thank you. Um, I'm trying to get... First, I want to make sure I understand um, what I was looking at as it relates to the chart. In fiscal year 22, it said there was 130, is it 130, 130,000 
uh, indivi- youth who were issued summons? What is that number? Well, 130 was juveniles that was issued summons for curfew violations. Okay. So I guess, I guess um, you know, if we expand where we are now, what does it look like? Is it is it a situation where um, police officers will be going around the community saying, hey, this young person is out past curfew. Let me uh, immediately transport this young person to this um, the resource center. Like, so how do we, what's the criteria to, um, what will the criteria be? I'm assuming this something may be ongoing of determining whether we're going to take this young person as, as opposed to transporting them home or telling them they have to get home. We need to take them and put them in essentially a detainment place. Well, if it's a first time offender, it's a first time offender, it's always preferred to transport the kid home okay. uh, to get them linked up with their, with their parents or with their guardians. Um, talk to the parent uh, about the situation. Obviously, you can go on the ordinance and give the parents a $50 fine if you want to do that. Probably would not do that on a first-time offense. Maybe not even on a, on a second one. But obviously, on a third, third or so, that would, that would be it. And that's pending, again, that it's a, that's all it's dealing with, is a curfew. I mean, but we also have kids. I mean, obviously, right now, I think we're trying to deal with just the curfew itself. But you also have at 1, 2 o'clock in the morning where they are not only violating the curfew, but there are some other criminal charges. So that moves it to a whole nother so, level. So with the resource center specifically, it may be a question for Councilwoman Logan, resource center specifically, assuming that we find the funding for it, the only youth that will be transported there will be the, those youth who will be, uh, I guess, only uh, issued a summons for curfew. It won't just be just for just for curfew. We have a list of about 12 offenses mm-hmm. that a juvenile could commit and be referred to the Family Resource Center. Okay, so then then that takes into consideration where we are now. We're talking about city over about 650,000 people. In FY22, we've only issued, see, 130 some is for curfew violation. And out of 130 summons for curfew violation, doesn't seem like a resource center is warranted if we already have a place that we're currently transporting. I'm trying to figure out how do we well, get there. Does the ends justify the means? Well, also with the Family Resource Center, it just recently opened up probably about three months ago. Uh, so during all these other violations, I mean, during these other times, 19, 20, 21, and early in 22, that center was not uh, was not open. Uh, so prior to that, and right now, the, as uh, when it happens, we're not taking the kid to the center. Right now, we're not doing that. What we would do is give the kid a summons. That summons can either go forward to juvenile court, or it will go to the family resource center if the if the kid and the family within 10 days report to the Family Resource Center for help, then that will keep that particular kid's offense out of juvenile court. So I, I get that. I get that. I'm, we're on the same page as it relates to that. I'm more specifically talking about 130 uh, young people who have been issued summons for fiscal year 22. Right. So are we going to create a center specifically for only 130 uh, young people who've been issued to summons. And then also, what I, what I, I guess, I'm always cautious. We pass legislation specifically targeting uh, a particular group of people that we don't find ourselves in a slippery slope. Here, it almost seems as if once we pass this or fund this particular center, This 130 number is going to significantly increase, and it's like we're almost going out and saying, look, you're out late. We're going to just make you go to this detention center. This detention center, resource center, we can call it whatever name we want to. It just, it it, it causes me pause. Well, and, and you're right. You know, if we implement this, there will be an increase because there'll be an expectation that Memphis police officers don't allow those individuals, those young people who are wandering the street any given night, there, you know, there could be hundreds of kids down on Bill Street and other places. Um, I think the reason you haven't seen as many 
uh, of these summonses is because of our capacity, okay. you know, to be able to address all of these young people. And officers are constantly thinking about how much time will they be babysitting and holding a, a, a young person in their vehicle, which is not a good thing either on a status offense. If it's not a criminal offense, we really should be, hurry up and get that child to some place of shelter and safety as opposed to riding around with them in, in a vehicle. But I think with the resolution, I think we have an opportunity to really think hard about how does this resolution serve the city in a way and, and, and potentially eradicate a problem that I think is very frustrating for the police department and for our citizens and potentially protect some of our kids from harm's way. Absolutely. So I'm, I'm like, you know, I want to state again, I'm on board with the idea that we have to do something to push back against um, delinquent delinquency in our community. I just don't want this to be a situation where much like our criminal justice system, when we have uh, open prison beds, there's an expectation that we fill those um, those prison beds. And we know what that means to uh, minority communities. I don't want this to be the same situation where we have open uh, or an empty uh, resource center and there's an expectation that we find some, some wrongdoer out there, whether they exist or don't exist, we fill this resource center with juveniles who may simply just been out late. And I don't want this to become uh, something that is not. So my hope is that we, we take time when we, when we look at this resolution and make sure that whatever we implement truly serves um, the city of Memphis and put the city of Memphis in the best light and also help right the wrongs and, and teach our young people what, what they should be doing. I'm just Absolutely. some pause, some pause there. Thank uh, you. Thank you. Sure that uh, my colleagues are um, informed. The, fam the Youth and Family Center is already open. They do not take youth after hours. So the and you, everything you mentioned about the family uh, Youth and Family Resource Center, that's already in play. That's already there. There's no solution for picking for the youth that are out past curfew after hours. On the books, we already have take them to juvenile to their parents. If you can't find their parents or the parents are not available, they don't have anywhere to go, take them to juvenile court. What this is, is at the resolution is asking you and administration to look at an option so that the police won't have to carry them around and drive around and babysit, as well as they will have another place to go outside of the juvenile court system if they're just, like you said, out at Bill Street or on their way home from work or going over to Cousin's house, wherever. But you don't have to take them to juvenile court. So we're exploring, like other cities, they have curfew centers. It's not the resource, the Youth and Family Resource Center. It's not juvenile court. It's just a place where you can take youth. And as I said, you may have wraparound services there. You may have counseling there, therapy, activities. If you look at the resolution, some curfew centers have midnight basketball leagues. They have um, other things that can be made available. We're not trying to answer that right here. We're not trying to tell you what to do. We're asking you and administration to go and explore what can be done. And this is just one approach to addressing juvenile, the spike in juvenile crime overnight and the violent crime that we've seen overnight by juveniles that's already on the books so what we're asking is for you all to go and take a look at it and inform us Absolutely. and we'll come back and then come back with that answer i do have one other colleague um councilwoman johnson and then we're going to call for the you okay after um oh, i'm sorry after Dockery and then uh, councilwoman johnson and then councilman carlisle we're talking about here. We're talking about uh, kids that are 16 and under uh, there to be in, say, on Monday through Thursday. These kids uh, would have to be in, in by 10 o'clock. Yeah, they would have to be in by 10 o'clock until 6 a.m., 10 p.m. to 6 a.m. On Friday through Sunday, it will be 11 p.m. to 6 a.m. 
if they were 18 and under, they would be, on Monday through Friday, it would be 11. They get one more hour more, uh, Monday through Friday. And on the weekend, on Friday through Sunday, 12 midnight to 6 a.m., uh, they should be in. Otherwise, they would be breaking the curfew law. The incident, crime incidents that you are encountering with, I'm, I'm going to say, young people, how many actually are under 18? This, you're out here. Pick me. How many are actually I under 18? In front of me, but, yeah. the, um, but we do have those numbers. We do have those numbers. Just don't have them here, but we have those numbers. We, we've had to chart them uh -huh. uh, to see what age limits uh, okay. that we're dealing with. And I think the youngest person that we've that I've seen on the chart was like six years old that was out, I guess, with other juveniles. He was what? Six, he was with six. He, okay. We, we, we do okay. Have my question is trying to get back to Councilman Smiley point. You got 130 that you're working with. But in actuality, I know we have some situations that where there's probably some exceptions. But truly, those creating the crimes, how many are under the age of 18 to justify less implement Has this WG curfew? Has just said to me approximately 45% of our Part one crimes are committed by that demographic. Young people that are under the age of 17, 16, 17 years old. So you're saying 45%. And that's, we can get you some more accurate numbers. And, and that has been the shift that mm -hmm. we've seen in recent months. Yep. You know, the numbers of young yep. people that are involved and younger people mm -hmm. right. that are involved in uh, criminal activity. Okay. Next question is, um, if you issue these summons, what type of identification are the kids going to have on them to be issued a summons? Sometimes they don't. That's what I'm saying. Yeah. So what do you do then? Sometimes they don't. And, and really, when, when we think in terms of status offenses like curfew violations, most of the time we're not talking about a young person who's committed a crime. Per right. Se. And our concern really is find that child some safe haven someplace so they're not wandering around in the streets so that they aren't victimized, so to speak. The trouble is, and we've talked about it, and I'm sure this work will help us to resolve that issue, is where do you take them? Because many times the parents who will receive the summons and have to bring that child to court um, isn't at home. So right. even though summons are issued, sometimes you know they don't have the level of follow-up or appearances in court that we would like. Just the effort and the attention uh, behind a resolution such as this, and maybe close some of those gaps, not turn these centers into detention centers, but places of safe haven for our young people. They could have recreation mm -hmm. until somebody comes to pick them up. And we've talked to the administration about this as well, you know, identifying locations or, you know, working towards finding locations that we can drop young people off. My other concern is if you have to pick someone up in Whitehaven and then having to drive them all the way back to Raleigh, look at what type of time is going to be involved. So when you come up with a suggestion, make sure you work with each location independently because that is going to be so time consuming in order to make sure that uh, well, well, solution well, works. I said on that, Councilwoman. Because that's the problem that we have experienced. Even with the, the, the few numbers that we have transported and taking kids home, having to take the kid all the way across town from downtown, uh, maybe all the way out to the Hickory Hill area, or maybe all the way down into South Memphis, it ties up the resource of the police, right. uh, especially if those officers are picking those kids up say on Bill Street mm -hmm. and they were assigned to Bill Street that night and now we got two or three transports that have taken officers out of that workspace so it is a concern and therefore it will need to be you know a plan that's going to be able to accommodate that and still be able to keep the officers available uh, for services but at the same time we got the, the complaint that we have juveniles running around on Bill Street at is that the major place where you are actually picking up the juveniles on Beale Street? 
It's just in and around. I mean, the entire the, the uh, entire downtown area. Sometimes. Well, y'all might need to come over with a substation down there in downtown on Beale Street. I think there's a, uh, a building, a spot down there, and just take everybody to that one location and drop them off. I'd give them a phone call to call home if they're down there. But I think if that's where it's concentrated, maybe we can use one as a pilot situation to see how well it works for you to document the uh, the issues that you encounter while you try to follow through with that particular uh, procedure. That's right. All right. Thank you. Those were my questions. Appreciate your answers and your time and your commitment. Thank you, Councilwoman. Uh, Councilwoman Dockery. Okay, should be track. Uh, Councilman Carlisle, and then we'll call for the vote. Thank you, Madam Chair. So I, I agree with and I, a lot of really good insight. I think there's two two things that I'm hearing. One is is touches, right? Like how much how much do we want our police department to get out and touch the youth? And, and I recognize it's a problem. Like people are upset about it. And part of it, and I, I'm glad Chief Davis made the point, which is like there are kids out, and so there's like curfew diversion, the piece of it, right? Hey, I'm out. Maybe it's my first time out with a group of people that, that I haven't really been out with, and, and, and it's straight up a curfew violation that if they keep hanging out with them, may turn into something down the road, which is a problem. But the reality is, is that what we're talking about here, and that's a big piece of it. I'm not sure how big, but the reality of it is the real issue, which is we have kids that are 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16 years old that are out. They ain't not allowed at 1045 rolling somebody's house or ringing and running anymore. They're, they're out packing heat and automatic weapons and handguns. And I think for me that that's where the real rub comes down. And we talk about permitless carry and reasonable articulable suspicion to stop somebody and ask them why they may have a gun and how old they are without the ability to identify. And I have a concern for our police officers in that regard. I mean, Chief Davis and I were talking this weekend you know, a lot of people have sent in viral videos of, of largely congregated groups and one patrol car or two asking themselves, well, why isn't that guy doing or, or, or woman doing anything? So I, I've got real concern about both of those issues. And again, how like on a, pra like I, Councilman Logan, I am 100% with you. Like I really am with you on a philosophical approach, but there is a pragmatic issue that we're facing. And we keep talking about the city and I, I mean, I hate to, I keep pounding or shirk responsibility, but when we arrest somebody, especially a juvenile, typically we turn them over to the sheriff's department. And then they are, they are then going through the process as a juvenile justice system, which is a constitutionally elected officer and his magistrates and funded by the county government. I'm not going to get into my high horse here about consolidation, but like the reality of the fact is, is we're trying to solve problems that are problematic based on the structure of how we are governed. And so all I'm saying is, is since we're not going to do that, there has to be some sort of joint resolution. The county has to bring their checkbook. It's not going to work. We, we, we have a $750 million operating budget. Theirs is over a billion dollars. So we really are going to either, we're, I'm going to use the term partner or shame, but, but like there's a bunch of brand new eager beavers over there that if they really want to help with blight, violent crime, like the things that they ran on, they are going to have to help fund, because that's really what we're saying, I think, Councilwoman, is fund. Whether that's pop-up uh, processing centers in, in parts where the, that's heavy, like, I don't want to say paddy wagon, like, that, that's not a good idea. But if we've got to bring the command truck out with the Sheriff Department command truck, you know, on high-volume weekends in the summertime where we know it's problematic, sure. But all of that costs money. Putting the plan together, I think, may be the easiest thing for you all to do. The question is, is who's going to pay for it? So... I'm, I'm supportive of this, but I just want to be clear for the record that I, I, we're, like, we're facing an actual pragmatic problem of who's paying for it. And so I think, I think I almost want to make this a joint resolution because our police department, again, one more time, cannot be expected to do everything in the House. So I'll leave you with those comments, but I would encourage you, Councilwoman Logan, since you're the pr primary sponsor, to reach out to a counterpart at the county commission to say, hey, I've heard multiple times, I've seen tweets and social media about partnership. 
this would be a great, this would be a very great low hanging fruit opportunity, I think, for the county commission to come in and fund something like this. Thank, Thank you. Thank you, Councilman Carla. And I definitely have several of them, and they are very eager to address this because they live in Shelby County. Um, but what we're doing today, um, because the, the citizens that are, you know, being affected are Memphis citizens as well. Do we just wait? Do we just, you know, sit? And so this gives them the opportunity to go and look at all of those and come back to us with a recommendation. Uh, I do, I totally agree and have already reached out um, to my colleagues' counterparts on, in the county as well. But we want to give the administration and, and um, the police department the opportunity to explore and come back. Um, but we definitely will be engaged and involved with this process. And so I appreciate, colleagues, all of your input. And it is, it's a very, um, you know, hot topic. It's a very, you know, uh, sensitive situation, but it's it's critical. We're at a critical state, and you know, for the safety of our citizens and for the safety of our children. These are still children, so we need to take a very exhaustive look at it. And so, I would like to go ahead and call for the vote, a roll call vote. Miss um, Crichton, would you go forth? Councilman Canale. Yeah. Councilman Carlisle. Okay. Colvett. Councilwoman Easter Thomas, Councilman Ford, yes. Councilwoman Johnson, yes. Councilman Jones, no stay. Is there a same in this one? Councilwoman Robinson, Is there a same in this one? Councilman Smiley, I'm an aye. Councilman Warren, aye. Councilwoman Dockery, yes. and Chair Logan, aye. And like same night minutes as well. Yes, sir. So did. Okay, we paid. Okay, Pat. Okay. Well, we'll wait on the same I'm going to retract the same Uh huh. Well, it, it already passed. Yeah, but Okay, yeah. Don't say nothing. No, it's say nothing. Thank you. Uh, that, if, are Thank there any you. other questions or any other business before this committee? If not, we're adjourned. Thank you.
Good afternoon. It is approximately 1.37 p.m. and the Planning and Zoning Committee is hereby called to order. May I have a roll call, please, Mrs. Dearborn? Councilman Warren. Present. Chair Johnson. Present. Today we have three items that we need to address in this committee. The first one being a, we're going to start with number two, a pub, uh, SAC 22-02, a public alley closure. It's the east side of North 4th Street, plus and minus 180 feet, 74.74 feet north of Court Avenue. It affects District 6 and Super District 8. Seven. It's been moved and I second it. May I have a presentation, please, from Planning and Zoning? I thought you were holding it. We're holding it. Oh. All right. Sorry, the applicant is not in attendance. Okay, that item has been held. To next council meeting. Yes, yes sorry, until the next council meeting. Okay, thank you. The next item that we're going to address is going to be the second reading for Z22-04. 3595 Honor Road, south side of Honor Road, plus or minus 1,259 feet west of Gitwell Road. Affects District 3, Super District 8. Can I get someone to move it? So moved. I second it. Being that this is the second reading, I don't know if we need necessary to have another presentation on this particular item. Unless zoning and development, you have something new to share with us? We do not. Okay. Well, I think we are going to move on with that one. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Having none, that item was passed on the second reading. The third one I think is interesting, so I was trying to wait on more of the council members to come in. Okay, let it be noted that Councilman Covet has joined us and we're going to go on to item number one plan development 22-18 4601 hutton way the northwest corner of interstate 55 and east shelby drive affects super district three super, i mean district three super district eight Planning and Development, may I have a presentation? Identify yourself, of course, first. Good, good afternoon, Seth Thomas from the Department of Planning and Development. So this case, uh, as mentioned by the chairwoman, is uh, PD 2218. Um, it's a plan development to regulate um, a, a vehicle sales campus at, at the existing uh, Chuck Hutton Automotive dealership uh, and the surrounding lots established as the Hutton subdivision. Uh, it's about 36.6 acres and is located in the commercial mixed use three district. Um, here's the location just um, west of I-55 in South Memphis. Here's the original subdivision plat that was recorded in um, 2010, which was sort of the first start of the, the establishment of, of this campus. However, I mean, here, here's an aerial of the, of the site as it currently exists, um, just north of Shelby Drive along Interstate 55. Um, the, the property uh, has the existing zoning of CMU3 and is surrounded by a mixture of uh, commercial, um, residential, and um, multifamily uses. As we can see here from the land use map, mostly vacant and commercial, at least surrounding the property on all sides. Um, here are some site photos of, of the subject property's northern private drive entrance and southern private drive entrance. Um, 
and some of the, the empty lots and then the, the existing uh, Toyota dealership. Um, so this is the concept plan. It's a, a large uh, campus with automotive dealerships, um, charging stations, uh, a digital photo building, um, and then also, um, which something that interests both us in the planning department and I'm sure city council is, is the, the solar panel farm that, that's proposed on the north side of the drainage easement that's also located within the slot, as you can see right here. Um, basically, in, in conclusion, the plan development is, is designed to regulate this automobile service campus, it, the, the dealership itself has been in continuous operation since 2009. However, the zoning code change in 2010, um, CMU 3 no longer allows automotive sales as a buy right use. Oh, so sure. the site switched from legal conforming to legal non-conforming. This plan development will bring all of it into a, a uh, you know, legal status um, and both will legitimize the existing vehicle sales use and allow for future expansion of the automotive dealership campus. Um, staff is recommending approval with the outline plan conditions, which uh, I guess I'm not necessarily going to re read through, but uh, can be found at the end of my presentation. And I'm uh, open for any questions. Thank you. Move it. Been moved and second moved by Corvette, second by Warren. Are there any questions? Uh, I know a couple of you walked in a little late, but you want to see a diagram or anything back on? Okay, it's the applicant here. And would they like to say something? Hi. My name is Corey Brady, 9967 Bentwood Creek Cove, Collierville, Tennessee. I am representing the applicant. Mr. Randy Chumley is in uh, the audience with us today to answer any questions you have pertaining to the dealership. As Seth mentioned, uh, this is the Chuck Hutton Toyota. It's Shelby Drive in 55. It was legally permitted in 2019. And at the time, the goal of the Henry Hutton was to establish a master plan campus environment for vehicle sales. And this represents the implementation of that goal. Uh, there is a charging station on site uh, that for EV vehicles, and there is also a solar power component at the northwest corner of the property that is in place to power the EV uh, booster and also the facility. None of the adjacent landscaping that was originally established with the subdivision or originally intended prior to 2009 has been modified. Uh, we're maintaining all of those requirements for buffers. We met with the neighbors. Uh, they were very pleased with what we proposed. There were some neighbors directly adjacent to the north boundary of the property. They came out to have their names as well. Uh, they're very pleasant, very nice to speak with. And again, they were very favorable to the project. With that said, we're here to answer any questions you guys have. Uh, if you do have any. Thank you. My concern was the fact if the neighbors had been contacted, especially the one who property, real property butts up to the site since you've had that contact. I, I'm pleased to hear that. Are there any questions? Hearing no questions, thank you. Thank, thank you, you for your information insight. See, no one with any additional questions. We're going to take this to a vote. All in favor, respond by saying aye. Aye. Any in opposition? Hearing none, that received a favorable motion. And that concludes the planning and the zoning committee at this time. Huh? Moving it. The second one was...
Meredith Keaton, a.k.a. Michael Kors. Please call roll. Councilwoman Johnson. Present. Councilman Jones. Here. Councilman Colvett. Here. Councilwoman Logan. Present. Councilman Canale. Here. Councilman Carlisle. Here. Barely. She's here. And Fully Chair present. Smiley. I'm here for sure. All right, we have four items on the agenda. We're going to get through these pretty quickly. Item number one, resolution approving a five-year lease for the use of right-of-way on the west side of Wagner Place, consisting of 11 parking spaces in Memphis, Tennessee, 3103, District 6, Super District 8, requested by the administration. There's a request for same nine minutes. Uh, Councilman Carlisle said we're not taking same nine minutes. Ms. Osborne? Yes, sir. Motion to approve. So moved. Second. Okay. All right. Have a moved by Warren, seconded by uh, COVID. Okay. Close enough. You are COVID, I think. Or well, you might be Carla. I don't know. Ms. Osborne, go ahead. Yes, sir. Uh, yes, Councilman. Uh, Carlton Osborne, uh, City of Memphis Real Estate, uh, 125 North Main. This particular uh, lease is uh, a five year lease for the rental of. The Wagner Place, uh, 11 parking spaces at Wagner Place. It was uh, basically, we've been negotiating this for about two years now. And uh, the reason I'm here today is as for approval, they want a five year lease rather than the standard one year lease that we would put in place normally. Uh, and uh, just ask for your approval. Uh, there's a. Uh, are, these, are these spaces currently under lease where you go down and you have to use your phone and pay for them on your phone right down by Riverside Drive? Is that where these are? Uh, Is that where these spaces are? Do you realize they're like $12 an hour? You realize what they're charging to park there, and it's no—it's not really published. You get you—you you sign up for those spaces, and when you pay for them, you know you got a twenty dollars that you paid to park two hours, and there's no rate until after you've paid. The way that the, that's how you pay for them there. If that's where I'm thinking it is. So um, the, this area is actually um, just south of Union. So there's roughly that's about it. 11 spaces south of Union. There is another segment of, of Wagner further south towards um, uh, Bill that is also a, a lease program there as well. So uh, the, the, the yeah, item um, listed for you today is, you know is the 11 spaces that's being requested to us to for, for the lease. Group. Does the same company own both of those? Um, negative, no, sir. And do you all happen to have any idea what the rates are per hour that they charge people? Um, not offhand, but I can get that information for you. Yes, yeah, so I, I would like to, if we could, hold this until we know what they're actually charging people and maybe get them to put some signage up so people won't pay for it before they know what it's going to cost them. So, are you done, Ms. Are you done, Councilman? Thank you. I'm done. I know uh, Councilman Covid has one. Uh, the owner is 99105 Front Street, LLC. Yes. So, that, well, that not the owner. That's the, that's the entity seeking. That would be the leasee. The leasee. Okay. So, are they just leasing it to, I mean, are they attempting to use this space to, uh, I guess, allow tenants of a particular building to use, or they're using this space just trying to allow uh, the general public to use it? I'm trying to get so, a better understanding. So this lease was generated, was basically proposed and given to real estate to put in place from traffic and engineering. So I'm going to allow... Uh, okay. Director Bell to to give more okay, information. Okay. Cool. <clears throat> I apologize again, Manny Berlin with the Division of Engineering. Um, so the the spaces is intended for the use of uh, the residents um, along that property. So those eleven spaces are going to be dedicated. And and I would I mean we have the representative here for for the company as well. Chase with the save. Yeah. <laughs> Go ahead. Hey, I'm Michael McLaughlin, 2115 Briar Brook, uh, Germantown, Tennessee. I'm one of the uh, developers of the project. Uh, the parking spaces are for the old butcher shop and pier restaurant that we've converted into residential and a little bit of 
uh, commercial on the front side. This is to supplement, there is underground parking, this is to add to the number of units uh, that we need parking spaces for. Okay. So I'm okay with not make, holding it then. Makes sense now. Okay. <laughs> and I'm happy to answer any other questions. <laughs> it makes you're sense not, now. You're not leasing it out to the public. No, it'll be, it'll be residents of, of the development. Okay, it makes sense to me now. Any other questions uh, by this body? All right. Doesn't appear there are any other inquiries from this no, particular you. body. Uh, there are no same nine minutes on this item. Uh, all those in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? All right. It's the pen of the chair that the eyes have it. Thank you. And thank you, Mr. Ms. I will butcher that. What's your first name? Michael. Michael. Mr. Michael. There we go. <laughs> item number two. Resolution requesting approval to, to sell city-owned property for $500, known as 1805 Castellia Street. Uh, parcel ID 06010600008, District 4, Super District 8, requested by the administration. Can I get a motion to second? Move it. Moved by Corvette, seconded by Warren. Mr. Osborne. You know? uh, yes, this particular property is a dilapidated property owned by the city. Uh, we've had several uh, bidders to come in and to uh, to do the renovations on it. So when Miss uh, Clariette came on behalf of uh, LOE Foundation, a nonprofit organization, to purchase and and demolish the the structure and then uh, redevelop the property at some time. It, we found it to be a great opportunity, so she's going to purchase it for $5,000, and we're asking for your approval. 5000 5, I'm sorry. Could oh, you, could you? I'm sorry. Five, uh, yeah. 5000 I think it's 5000 Mr. Arsmore, could you? Who's the owner exactly? The owner, the owner is is the city of Memphis. No, who who are you attempting to sell the property to? Oh, her name is Renarda Clariet. Okay, She's, council, I would like to pull this item from the agenda. Yeah, pull it. Correct. It's five grand. The resolution is five. It's enough right. for me. Resolution five grand. The we'll withdraw this item. Mr. Mr. Osborne, we would like to. I'm, uh, move to table this item. Table this item indefinitely. Okay. Is there an objection? Thank you. Without objection. Thank you. Next item. Item number three, resolution of requesting approval to sell city-owned property for $33,400, known as Zero Peach Avenue, uh, parcel ID 02-0066-00027, District 5, Super District 9, requested by the administration. Can I get a motion to second? Second. All right, Mr. Osborne, floor is yours. All right, this is uh, a city-owned property uh, in, the, uh, in the neighborhood of uh, Evergreen Historic District. Uh, Mr. Benjamin Ratcher approached uh, real estate for the purchase of this item uh, some time ago. Uh, we noticed that it did have some drainage infrastructure on it. Uh, he is going to be using this for the quiet enjoyment of his family. And uh, he uh, actually worked with engineering to, for us to uh, have the uh, drainage easement recorded on this document prior to the purchase. He also paid for the appraisal, and uh, he is asking for a sale price of, uh, well, we're asking for a sale price of $30,000, which he's in agreement with, and we're asking for approval for this uh, sale of this piece of property. Thank you very much, Mr. Osborne. Seeing as our chairman is busy, uh, Doc Warren would like to Just be recognized. Just a quick question. You know, the documents that we got to look at, the map that we saw was just like one sort of big gray area. Uh, and I'm wondering in the future when we have properties that are listed as zero Main Street or zero Front Street, could we have the numbers of the adjacent properties that still have a number on them? So we'll have an idea about where that is. Okay. And that way we can, we can know where the property is and what's going on. Um, and uh, I guess is is the potential purchaser here? 
Uh, I don't think he's present today. He is. Uh, if, if I think he is, he's in he the is? back. Oh, uh, oh, if we could just like ask him to maybe tell us what he's going to do or why he likes the property, it'd be nice to know. Mr. Ratchet. Thank you very much, Doc. Uh, Cheyenne, Councilor Johnson, you're recognized. We can tell. Council Lady Johnson, would you turn your mic on for me? For clarification purposes, what is the exact sales price? Because we're hearing um, two different things. The exact sale price. $33,400. Okay. Uh, Council, um, this lot is a SCAR that's a remnant from the I-40 uh, bypass that came through. Um, it's, you know, city has had it and has struggled to maintain it, and we've been maintaining it. And so we propose to buy it from the city, generate tax revenue. Uh, Does it abut your property? This is adjacent to our so, house. So it just gives you sort of a bigger side yard? Exactly. It sounds like a great idea. Thank you. Thank you. Anybody else in the queue? Yeah. So, oh, Johnson, are you Benjamin. in the queue? Okay, Councilman Jones. Yeah, um, the assessor property site. And the assessor has it appraised at 50600 So my question is, why are we selling it? for an amount that's less than the appraised value of the assessment. But well, there, there was an adjustment made due to the, uh, the easement and the entire use of the property would be diminished because of the drainage easement that's going across it. So uh, we had an appraisal done on the property which came back at the $30,000 $30, okay. mark. And since we added the cost of the appraisal, that's what brought the price up to 33400 Okay, thank you. <laughs> you're, not in the, you're not in the queue, Councilman Carlisle. <laughs> All right. All those in favor? Aye. Any opposed? All right. The ayes have it. Thank you so much. All right. All right. What's that? Thank you. Anything else? All right. With that, this committee is adjourned. All right, four. Oh, got done too quickly. All right, item number four, resolution to appropriate the sum of 400000 and other project costs to implement FY23 Urban R Plan, CIP Project EN23301, funded by GO Bonds, all council districts requested by the administration. There's a request for the same nine minutes. I'm going to go ahead and ask. Is there a motion to second? Well, move it. Moved by Jones, seconded by Corvette. Um, as it relates to the same nine minutes, is it absolutely necessary? Uh, no, no, sir. Uh, All right, we're going to go ahead and take it off the same nine minutes. minutes. All right, go ahead. Uh, thank you, Manny Belen with the Division of Engineering. Uh, so during the FY23 budget year, uh, Urban Art Commission provided um, uh, their book in terms of some of the artwork that they're going to be doing across the city. Uh, you all um, allocated $400,000 to carry out the Urban Art Plan. Uh, and what we're asking for today is to appropriate those funds so that the Urban Art Commission can continue on in that effort. Thank you. Any questions by the council? All right, it appears that all hearts and minds are clear. All those in favor? Aye. Any opposed? All right, the ayes have it. This adjourns the committee. Thank you. Oh, hold up. Before the committee is adjourned, Councilman. Someone from the Urban Art Commission to come down. I know they did a presentation early on, but if they've got anything that's coming near term, and, we, and if we have time, it's not totally, and I'm, Chairman Smiley, I'm saying this to you, if there's time, That'd be cool if not. But I always like to hear what, you know, what they're working on, what's going on, where it's going. People like, you know, yeah, thank you, Chair. Absolutely. Hopefully, hope and see someone from the Urban Art Commission. Okay. All, the, all right. This committee is adjourned. Thank you.
I'd like to call the Personnel and Government Affairs Committee to order. Uh, we have one item today. It's the discussion of our 2023 legislation, uh, le legislative agenda. All council districts, it's been requested by Chairman Jones, and I'd like to call on Chairman Jones to bring us up to speed. Chairman Jones. Oh, I need a roll call. Go ahead. Thank you. Members, President, Councilwoman Johnson, Councilman Canale, Councilwoman Robinson, Councilman Jones, Here. Councilman Cobet, Here. Councilman Ford, Councilman Carlisle, Councilwoman Logan, and Vice Chair Warren. Present. And now, Chairman Jones. Got you. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Colleagues, uh, I ask this item to be on our agenda to ask each of you. As we start, uh, well, in January when the General Assembly starts, I was hopeful that we'll have an opportunity to develop our legislative, develop our legislative agenda before the General Assembly starts. On the 25th, I'll be out of town, but I've asked uh, Councilman or Vice Chair Smiley to stand in uh, my absence. That's when the Shelby County delegation will be hearing from the county, be hearing from the city, and perhaps Shelby County Schools of what their legislative ask will be. So we have a meeting. Our meetings after this meeting will be the 11th as well as the 18th of October. So prior to his meeting with the Shelby County delegation, I was hopeful that we can submit what we want our request to be. You know, each one of us may, if we're 13 of us, we might have 13 different items. We don't necessarily want to present 13 items. Perhaps we might want to distill it down to three, four, five, or six, and let that be an ask, too. I've also consulted with Ms. Ring uh, with the administration to see if there's some coordination between, she said they're still working with their legislative agenda, uh, but hopefully there can be some coordination between what the council asks, particularly when it comes to financial items or financial assets we may have. So uh, as you, over the next couple of weeks, I just ask that you think about some things that you would want to hear um, one of the things that I thought about and we've discussed from time to time as far as far as the legislative agenda is the 50 the maximum $50 fine that's currently in place in order to get that change we have to have that done at the general assembly level so if we can have that ask ask and perhaps uh, some other ideas that you all may have so just be thinking about that over the next couple of weeks uh, hope so by the 11th that's when I would ask that you submit it so that we can approve it. We might have to work it and twerk, uh, not twerk it, but <laughs> tweak it. <laughs> might pass it if we do it that way. <laughs> well done. Well done, Chair. Dude. Dude. So, you know, we can distill it down to those items and we have a, uh, we'll have a full legislative agenda uh, on behalf of the council that we can submit to the General Assembly and then once, this, once the session starts, our lobbyists will have their marching orders as far as what we want as the, want the priorities to be for this next, next year. And so that was the purpose for this item. So, Mr. Chair, uh, briefly uh, for our uh, administrative assistants and our research assistants, they need to get with each of us and get our legislative agenda recommendations by the 11th. Yes. And on the 11th, we should have at least part of the committee bringing this up and discussing it and voting on what we want to take forward at that point. Correct. And so, so the, yes. guys, get with us and make sure that we do we do this and get to you. Okay. Any comments? Uh, Mr. Carlisle. Uh, there you are. Thank you, Mr. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And uh, Chairman Jones, I appreciate you doing this. We've been talking about doing something like this for couple years now and it's it is critically important like I'm headed up tomorrow to Nashville and I'm gonna get asked you know what do you guys want to do and and I can't speak on on behalf of the council until the council speaks on the matter and so you know it, and on the deadlines I know we usually set them in place but as Chairman Jones and I were talking about upstairs we're I don't want to say we're behind now but like we're almost already behind so it's very critically important that we all if there's if there is something some initiative some policy issue some financial ask that we get them in because we are going to have to start doing we're going to, have to start socializing it we're going to have to find sponsors we're going to have to find co-sponsors in both houses 
And so all of that stuff takes early runway and groundwork. I can assure you that the administration's been working on their ask since probably last June. May, maybe. So if not, not, so again, things like rental registries or the fines or mental health resources, those things. So anyway, I just want to thank the chairman for, for making this happen. Um, and I hope that everybody takes the opportunity and, and, and I look forward to it because as we've started to really realize there's only so much that we can do from this dais and we're going to need that, that partnership. So again, tip of the cap to the chairman. Appreciate you. Any other questions or comments? If not, uh, uh, this Personnel and Governmental Affairs Committee is now adjourned.
Good afternoon. The September 27th, 2022 executive session of the Memphis City Council is hereby called to order. Ms. Owens, would you conduct a roll call, please? Ford. Councilwoman Logan. Present. Councilman Smiley. I'm here. Councilman Warren. Present. Councilman Colvett. Here. Councilwoman Robinson. Present. Councilman Canale. Here. Councilwoman Johnson. Present. Chair Jones. Present. Uh, colleagues, if you are referencing the, uh, the, the agenda that was sent out last Thursday, it's a little bit different. So there were two items on there. They will be, they have been kicked to the next meeting. So what you should be going on is a more recent one that does not include anything. But what I'll do now, we have uh, item, well, the first item that we need to discuss today is Councilman Kovat has held his grant resolution for two weeks. Uh, number two, though, Councilman Ford, you're recognized. I think that you have a item, please. Yes, uh, Mike. Thanks, Chair. Yep, I have a resolution to amend the Council FY23 grant allocation for Memphis Health Center in the amount of $10,000. Okay. Mm -hmm. uh, and are you moving it? Moving it. Okay. Second. Is there a second? So if there's no objection to that, we're going to add that to the night's agenda same with same night, night yeah, minutes. Same night minutes. Thank uh, you, sir. $10,000 will go to the Memphis Health Center. Appreciate you. Thank okay. you. Uh, I, colleagues, also, I have a grant resolution, too, that I would like to, to move, and that would be $5,000 for Feed the Needy. Uh, $5,000 for a Zion Community Project. And Ms. Owens, I need to amend it again. And uh, $5,000 for Memphis Health Center as well. Second. Okay. So I've moved that and seconded by Councilman Ford. Uh, so so I'm, uh, I'm, yes, sir, give me one second. Going to come back to yours? We need to reconsider yours? Okay. So we'll, we'll come back to it. We we'll come back to it. So, uh, colleagues, I'm uh, presenting a grant resolution, and my grant resolution would be five thousand for feed the needy, feed the needy, five thousand for the Zion project, and then five thousand for Memphis Health Center. So, uh, I've moved it, seconded by Councilman Ford. If there's no objection. This will be added on to tonight's agenda with Save Night Minutes. And so, let me go back to you, and let me have you first to. Uh, move to reconsider the item that we approved for you. Yeah, I'd like to move to reconsider. Well, is there a second? Add on Zion. Well, let yeah. me, is there a second for second. the reconsideration? Second. Okay, if there's no objection, we're going to reconsider okay. the motion that was made by you previously, and you're going to amend it to include Zion for $5,000, in, in the amount of $5,000. Okay, so yeah. if there's no objection, colleagues, he's amended his to include uh, 10000 for the Memphis Health Center, 5000 for the Zion community project for 15,000 total. Yes. Okay, so yes. Is all those in favor of that uh, amended request by Councilman Ford, please signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? Thank you, Mr. Thank Ford. Thank you, Chair. Uh, Council members Robinson, Logan, Warren, and Johnson have amendments to their grant allocation. I will call on each council member, please state the organizations you are awarding grant money to, followed by the amounts. Councilwoman Robinson. So, unless it has changed, do you have it, Councilwoman? Okay. Allison? I'm sorry. Uh, I didn't have your mic on. Okay, thank you. Blue City Cultural Center, 5,000. NAACP, Memphis Branch, 5,000. Feed the Needy, 5,000. Memphis Health Center, 5,000. And Africa in April, Cultural Awareness Festival Incorporated, 5,000. That's a total of 25,000. Thank you. Thank you. Councilwoman Logan. Uh, I'd like to extend 5,000 to Feed the Needy, 5,000 to Africa in April, 2,500 to the Zion Community Project, 25 to the Urban Promise 901 and 5,000 to Memphis Mental Memphis Health Center. No rush. Uh, do you have a total for And us? that's total is 20,000. And I so move. 20,000. Okay. Yeah. Well, uh, it's going to be one motion since you okay. all already heard all right. an executive. Councilman Warren. Uh, yes, thank you. I'd like to uh, 
uh, amend the 25,000 F23 grant allocations and donate uh, 5,000 to Feed the Needy, 5,000 to Africa in April, 3,000 to Urban Promise 901, and 5,000 to Zion Community uh, Cemetery for a total of $18,000. Okay. And Councilwoman Johnson. Your microphone, please. Uh, microphone, please. I would like to amend the Council Fiscal 23 grant allocations, Feed the Needy, 15000 Zion Community Project, 5000 Africa in April, 10000 CCMI, Breaking a Stronghold, 5000 Aaliyah, Laymen in Action, House of Memphis Incorporated, 5000 a total of 40000 Okay, thank you. So are there any objections to these friendly amendments? I have, I need to judge that. Okay, so let me you recognize Councilwoman Logan. Uh, yes, I left off one, so do I need to amend it? No, just state it's... what it is. Dennis hasn't finished their application yet, so they're not yet eligible. Oh, okay, I'm sorry. Okay, okay. never mind. Okay. So we may want to hold off on that one. Oh, okay, so what? So I believe Councilwoman well, Logan... Just speaking to the mic for us, on the record for us. So I believe Councilwoman Logan, Councilman Warren, Councilwoman Johnson. Hey, myself. And yourself all allocated money to Zion Community Project, which puts them over their eligibility requests. So I believe they're at 20,000, but they're only eligible for 15. 15, okay. So. Uh, That'll get us there. We'll, we'll do the same. Yeah. I'll do 25. You accept that? I did 25 initially. Well, oh, you did 25 initially? Yeah. Okay, so you and I will modify ours to 25 a piece. Well, no. No, you just need to modify yours to 2,500 because if I'm five. Uh, wait, did four? We can't do good math. <laughs> wait, four did something. Okay, I'm okay, ashamed. okay, okay. <laughs> I'm ashamed. So. I tell you what. Twenty-five. Hundred. Twenty-five. Hundred. Okay, he's not okay. Um, Ms. Robinson, did you do twenty-five design? I mean, five thousand design. Okay. Five, four, ten. Who did? Oh. Cheyenne Shane gave five. Council Twenty five hundred. So if, if mine is fifteen thousand five hundred. Okay. If I reduce mine to twenty five hundred. And I do twenty five, then we take it from twenty. That's still seventeen. That'd be seventeen fifty. That's fifteen. Yeah. Okay. You were twenty five. Don't matter. Don't matter. We had the staff that it take to get to fifteen thousand. <laughs> thousand Councilman oh. Warren, twenty five hundred, <laughs> Councilman Jones, twenty five hundred, Councilman Ford, five thousand, and then we have Council Member Logan at twenty five. So we are at seventeen thousand five hundred. I'll just I'll just withdraw my donation. Okay. <laughs> that'll work. Right. That'll be that'll be the easiest thing. So five thousand from Shame. Johnson. For 2500 from Logan and Jones, that gets us a 15000 So it, are there any objections to the friendly amendments that have been uh, brought forth? Objection. Seeing none, uh, those are approved without objections, and those will be added on to our fiscal consent agenda. Colleagues, we have one item that's going to be held. That's going to be item number four. It's going to be held for two weeks. We also have some add-on items. We have seven add-on items for this afternoon. Number 48 is a resolution to accept $4,921,000 in pledge donations from the University of Memphis Auxiliary Services Foundation from private donors and a $50,000 donation from Fleming Architects and Grinder Tabor Grinder in support of the construction of the new Leftwich Tennis Center CIP Project PK. 03005.
That's District 5, Super District 9, sponsored by the administration. There's a request for St. Night Minutes. Uh, number four, item 49 is gonna be a resolution to amend the council fiscal year 23 grant allocations, all council districts sponsored by Councilwoman Robinson. Request to add this to the uh, f uh, add this to the fiscal consent agenda for same night minutes. Resolution to amend the fiscal year 23 grant allocations. All council districts sponsored by Councilwoman Logan. Uh, request to add this to the fiscal consent agenda for same night minutes. Number 51 is gonna be a resolution to amend the council fiscal year 23 grant allocations. All council districts sponsored by Councilman Warren. There's a request to add fiscal consent agenda, add this to the fiscal consent agenda for save night minutes. Item number 52 is gonna be a resolution to amend council fiscal year 23 grant allocations, all council districts sponsored by Councilwoman Johnson, request to add to fiscal consent agenda for same night minutes. Resolution to amend fiscal year 20, item 53, is a resolution to amend council fiscal year 23 grant allocations, all council districts sponsored by Councilman Ford, requested, to add this to fiscal consent agenda for same night minutes. And then item number 54, resolution to amend fiscal year 23 grant allocations, all council districts uh, sponsored by yours truly. A request to add that with fiscal, with same night minutes to the fiscal consent agenda. Our same night minutes for this evening will be items 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 48, 49, 50, 51, 52, 53, and 54. Once again, our add-on items are items number 48 through 53, and our same night minute items are 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 48, 49, 50, 51, 52, 53, 54, and 55. If there's no other business to come before this meeting, we are adjourned. See everybody at 3.30.